Welcome to the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee's 18th meeting of 2019. Before we move to the first item on the agenda, can I remind everyone to switch off mobile phones as they may affect the broadcasting system? And uh, Can I remind everybody that's round the table that broadcasting will uh, organise the microphones so there's no need to press any buttons, you just speak and broadcasting will deal with it. The first item on the agenda is for the committee to take further evidence on the climate change emissions reduction target Scotland Bill at stage two. And since the committee reported in the bill at stage one, we've received responses from the Scottish Government. The Committee for Climate Change have published their updated advice and the Cabinet Secretary has made a statement in Parliament outlining the Scottish Government's response to the global climate emergency. And ahead of considering amendments at stage two, we've heard from the Committee for Climate Change and the Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform um, before hearing from stakeholders this morning on the updated advice to the Scottish Government. And delighted to welcome everyone in our uh, first round table of the morning. Um, we're going to be focusing on the broad issues and impacts, effectively what this new advice and the acceptance of that advice by the Scottish Government means for Scotland and the action that we take forward now. Um, we've an hour and a half with you, um, and before we explore your views, can I invite everyone around the table to introduce yourselves? I'll maybe go just from my left right round. I'm, of course, Gillian Martin, the convener of the committee. Professor Jaffrey. Christine Jaffrey. I direct the Centre for Climate Justice at Glasgow Caledonian University. Angus MacDonald, MSP for Falkirk East. I'm Ben Wilson, the Policy Officer at SCIAF, the Scottish Catholic International Aid Fund. Uh, Stuart Stevenson, MSP, and the bill we're amending is the bill I took forward in 2009. Dave Ray, uh, Professor of Carbon Management, University of Edinburgh. Uh, hello, I'm Mark Winskill. I'm Senior Lecturer at the University of Edinburgh, and I'm Policy Director of Climate Exchange. OK, I we'll have my clerking team to my left. John, um, John Scott, MSP for the year. Uh, Jim Ski, Chair of the Just Transition Commission. I'm Rachel Howell, Lecturer in Sustainable Development at the University of Edinburgh. I'm Claudia Beamish, South Scotland MSP and Shadow Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform. I'm Jim Densham from RSPB Scotland, uh, representing Scottish Environment Link today. I'm Clive Mitchell, an outcome manager for People and Nature at Scottish Natural Heritage. I'm Mark Ruskell, MSP for Mid Scotland and Fife. Okay, so I'm going to ask a very broad question, first of all, uh, just to start us off, and I guess it's, it's the million dollar question. Uh, we know where we need to go. We've been told the targets that um, think that there are pathways to get to. How do we get there? Just, Jim. <laughs> go there. Oh, yeah. Well, well, thank you. Well, I mean, the CCC report is is uh, you know quite challenging, and I've now had a chance to go the way through the whole report. The first thing to say, I think, is it's very good in providing a sort of snapshot of what a net zero world would actually look like. But the report actually says very little, actually, at the moment about the pathway of, of how you would actually need to get there. And this is something, obviously, from the point of view of the Just Transition Commission, that we really need to explore in more depth, because the pathway and the journey from here to net zero is actually going to be the big challenge. Obviously, the invitation in terms of Scotland was also to think about the level of ambition for the intermediate years of 2030 and 2040 as well. So the CCC has come up with some numbers there, you know, expanding the ambition, uh, the reduction by 2030 from 66 to 70 percent. But I think I have to say, looking at the report, there wasn't a lot of detailed bottom up analysis that got you from the 66 to the 70. It was very much a case of drawing a kind of straight line from where we are now to the net zero point. So I think there's got to be a lot of work in Scotland on the revised climate change plan, which I think will need dialogue with the Just Transition Commission to sort that out. So I think in the question of how do we get there, yeah, it, it's the million dollar question. And you know, it's something that we really need to start working on. But the CCC has given us the start of the thought on that. Any other thoughts on that? Professor we, we know the roadmap ahead, ambitious targets um, set before us. Uh, from, from my perspective, um, we have a really good understanding of the technology 
um, and the knowledge <coughs> that we need to put in place to get there. And, and to answer the question, how do we get there? I think what, what we really need to focus on is um, societal and behavioural change. We need to engage with the public. Public engagement is critical to achieving a low carbon economy. Um, how we engage with the public across all sectors of society no matter what the, the ethnic minority or, or the inequalities or the social justice aspects, it's absolutely critical that we engage with them. And there's an, an absolute must for looking at education um, and um, a, a broader set of educational and um, public engagement messages that need to get through um, is vital to, the, to this. OK, Mark Rinscoe. Yeah, so I think the CCC have uh, made uh, a point of saying that the... the uh, target was very much the, the end point, uh, the 2050 net zero, the feasibility and affordability of that. And I, I think they have demonstrated that. I think there's, there's a lot of uh, analysis. There is a lot of bottom-up bottom analysis that, uh, that uh, has worked its way into the report. In fact, the, the, the analysis was done on a, on a bottom-up basis rather than a top-down basis, and there's some discussion about, about, about that in the report. Uh, I, I do agree with Jim that uh, the actual filling in of, in of the interim targets needs a lot more analysis. Um, that needs analysis within Scotland as well as the UK. And I think this, the committee have been fairly open about that. Uh, I, think, I think they've demonstrated what they were asked to do, which was to, to demonstrate the feasibility, affordability of net zero by 25, 2045 for Scotland, 2050 for, for the UK. So I don't think they see it as, as the finished job themselves. So, uh, I should say that climate exchange will also be very keen to work with government uh, across, across government on filling out the evidence base, which is something we've been doing all, already in, in the time we've had. Jim Dyson. Thank you. Um, what the Climate Change Committee said very clearly in their report is that Scotland can go much faster than the UK because of our you know, wealth of, of carbon and uh, ability and land to store more carbon and to sequester more carbon, which is really encouraging. And it shows that nature-based solutions can do so much for us to help achieve those targets. So we really need to put those in place uh, very soon, um, not just for for uh, the climate, but obviously for nature and, and, and solving like the multiple problems that we have in terms of a biodiversity loss, as well as the climate change issue. Um, that's really important. Um, obviously, the, the report talks about um, afforestation is something that we've known about for a long time. It includes peatland restoration this time, which is really obviously very important. And we have a great opportunity to do that in Scotland. It doesn't, it touches on other things, but there is much more that we can do. I think one of the things about the report is this committee has talked about is that it's using today's technologies. It's using, it says it's feasible with today's technologies and there's lots more that we will know about quite soon or we can know about if we put more effort into it, such as the value of blue carbon. Um, we know that there are huge stores. SNH has, has um, put lots of work into calculating the stores of carbon in our marine environment. That's okay as a, as a block of storage and we must protect that, but we can recreate coastal habitats to store a lot more carbon. And an RSPB report from a couple of years ago called um, Glorious Mud looked at how much potential there is for coastal realignment right now. We could do up to 4,000 hectares of coastal realignment right now, which would store huge amounts of carbon uh, in, in, uh, in those coastal areas right now. So those things aren't included in the report and could be, and there are many more other sort of technologies which we will know more about if we put more money and effort into research them. OK. Uh, David Ray. So, yeah, in terms of how we get there, I think uh, Professor Jaffrey, I completely agree with, with her points in terms of we need to bring everyone with us. This is going to be really difficult. So what the Committee on Climate Change have laid out is, um, is really stretching in terms of the 2045 target. And at the moment, we've got this context of real public support, I think, for what the Scottish Government have done in terms of accepting the advice and going for that target. We've got great will, but there's a real risk of losing that. And I think Jim's commission is key to that in terms of the just transition. I also think the skills, so that was highlighted in the Committee on Climate Change report, the skills based to deliver this across all the sectors in our society, we haven't got that capacity yet. We need to build that. And so there's a real role for, for further education, higher education, um, all levels in terms of getting the, that skill base there so we can transition in terms of jobs but also deliver 
across everything from, uh, like Jim was describing, the peatland restoration needs expertise right through to how we, you know, how we have zero carbon housing, for instance. So it's, it's the people, as ever, are the, are the way we will get there. Yeah. yeah Rachel Hill. Uh, one thing I'd like to stress is that we'll get where we want to go uh, if we start immediately. This is a really interesting um, thing we've got to do because it, it's a long-term project. It's a marathon in one sense, but we've got to go out of the blocks as if it's the 100 or 200 metres. Um, so I think we need to be very, very careful to understand that whatever date is set for reaching net zero, we haven't got, uh, you know, 30 years or whatever to start. It's starting right, right now. Um, uh, like Professor Jaffrey and, and uh, Dave Ray, I think it's very important the public engagement aspect. That's the bit that uh, my expertise speaks to. In addition to education, I think there are um, also other, other ways that we can make this um, a collaborative effort with civil society uh, organisations to help overcome some of the barriers to, uh, to public engagement and to behavioural change. Um, ways, for example, to increase a sense of agency and self-efficacy, and I'm, I'm happy to explore and give some suggestions about that. Yeah, um, I'm happy for you to do that right now. I mean, okay. Because, because what, one of the things that seems to me that if public engagement might just attract the people who are already completely aware of mm. the sort of things, the actions, the data, the actions that they might yeah. take. But how do you reach those harder to reach people yeah. whose life is going to affect? I think um, we're at a really exciting uh, place now in terms of the context of uh, engagement because the polls are showing that there's a higher level of concern about climate change um, than for many, many years. So the, the, the proportion of people who are aware and engaged is much higher than it has been. And that will be helping to change social norms. And so the, the hardest to reach people, I think, will in part, come along once things become more normal. So one of the things that I think is most important is that we um, make it the most normal or the cheapest or the easiest thing to do things in a sustainable way. Um, and we're also seeing that the, the media attention to climate change is the highest it's been since the Paris Agreement in 2015. So, for example... One, one aspect I've written about in my response was uh, the dietary changes that we need from a health perspective as well as a climate change perspective. Now, there's lots of different barriers to people adopting more sustainable behaviour. Some of those are financial, some of those are practical. For example, if, uh, if you don't have a bus service, that you can't commute by bus and so on. But some of them are more psychological. Um, and when it comes to dietary change, some of those will be the more psychological barriers. So there are quite a lot of people who are saying, I'm willing to make changes, for example, changing my diet, or, uh, for example, cutting down flying would be another. Um, I'm willing to make changes if I can see that others are making them too. There's no point me doing it on my own. So we could work with groups in society uh, who are pushing for greater changes, you've got Extinction Rebellion, Friends on the Earth, whatever, and say, right, okay, these could be organisations which would set up commitment platforms, which would actually work with their members and with the supporters to set up uh, sort of agreements where people say, yes, I'll commit to doing this, and there could be different levels of commitment, if this many other people also commit to it. And that's how you can kind of overcome some of the agency, some of the psychological issues, and actually give the civil, so civil society organisations organisations which are, are pushing you to do more, a role to play in engaging their members on that sort of thing. Um, and that could be a relatively low cost way. Now obviously there are other barriers that are going to be needing policy change and are going to be needing infrastructural changes and it's extremely important that we or you, the policy makers, are not asking individuals to commit to behavioural changes where the barriers are such that they can't remove them. Um, but that's one of the things that I could see being quite a useful contribution. You know, so you've got Extinction Rebellion, for example. Whatever target is chosen for going net zero, they're going to say it's not enough. But I would be wanting, personally, to go back to them and say, OK, so get your members to commit. If you can do more than this report is expecting society to do, then we can do more. It's on asking people to put in practical actions yeah. it, rather than just... That's what people are wanting now. Yeah. That's what people are wanting. Yeah. They want to know what they can actually yeah. do themselves. Uh, Clive Mitchell. Thank you. Um, I think we have a triple challenge in terms of how we get there. Um, the Net Zero report makes it quite clear, as, as Jim's already indicated, 
that we can't get there without land use, land use change and forestry emissions being taken into account. Over the time scale that we have to do it to 2040, there's at least another half a degree of warming left in uh, the inertia that resulting from previous emissions. So the trends and changes that we've seen in terms of drought and floods and pests and disease and so on will intensify and get a bit worse over the same period. So we have to adapt at the same time as we take actions to reduce emissions going into the atmosphere. And since we can't put a spade in the ground with affecting both adaptation, mitigation and the state of nature, we need to address issues to do with the loss of biodiversity at the same time as we move to a net zero economy. As others have said, doing that through a, a just transition to, to that economy. Um, I think it's worth reflecting in terms of the points that have been made about collaboration, that in terms of mitigation, we can see what we can do on the basis of an organisation by organisation, sector by sector approach over the last 10 years, which is three or four percent emission reductions a year, which is impressive and, and it's been great to see that. But we need to more than double that from 2020 onwards in order to get onto that net zero pathway. And I think the key to that, as others have already indicated, lies in collaborative place-based approaches um, to create those communities of interest and, and peer groups that we can, we can identify with and move with together, um, addressing both mitigation, adaptation, state of nature and the associated UN Sustainable Development Goals all at the same time. Okay. We have a couple of uh, members wanting to ask questions. First person with his hand in the air was Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much, convener. Listen with interest so far. And it seems to me the contributions have fallen into two stools. Um, the larger is controlling emissions, the slightly smaller, which uh, Rachel and Tajim, uh, Tajim uh, focused on, uh, Jim and Clive perhaps more looking about sequestration and mitigation. And I just wonder how the two play off, because of course what we're looking for is not zero, we're looking for net zero. Now, the report that we're, we're looking at focused much more on emissions, rather less on sequestration. And I just wonder if there's more to do. Now, sequestration, of course, is one of these apparent free lunches. Because if you could do it all by sequestration and not have to change behaviours, wouldn't that be lovely? Except there are other reasons for changing behaviours, besides just what we're dealing with. And I just wondered how these two play off against each other and whether in the room we've got specialists, if you like, in emission management and changing behaviours and specialists in sequestration and how can policymakers and government help focus these people with the specialisms to deliver the maximum in the area without necessarily being distracted by what other specialists would do in other areas. In other words, trying to break the generality of the problem into the specific contributions that each of us can make in our scientific and professional lives. How do we do that as policymakers? Yeah, I saw Mark Winskill nodding at that. Yeah, well, I think it's a great question. Uh, I work for a body called Climate Exchange, which is um, one of a uh, number of centres of expertise funded by the Scottish Government. Climate Exchange deals with both adaptation and mitigation. So we think about this quite quite a lot, and uh, it's very much the business of bringing different specialists together in a collaborative environment. I mean, I think we're talking. Stuart was talking about the policy challenge, but it's also mirrored by a research challenge. How do we actually bring the different disciplines or the different expertise together to think about this as a whole economy problem? Which is absolutely clear now that this has to become a whole economy challenge uh, throughout governments, throughout different layers of government. But there's also a, an equivalent challenge for us as researchers because you have got a number of different experts around this table. And um, one other thing that, that's difficult for, for, for researchers and all kinds of different specialists is to, to, to bring that together. So that does need real attention. I think that real, needs real attention in thinking about how government funds its research, uh, how we go forwards on this together how we do the anal analytical job. There's been a lot of attention uh, 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 through the Scottish Times model, which we talk about, but that's just one way of thinking about the whole economy challenge. Um, I had one other point I just wanted to come back to, because I think there's a, there's a, 
uh, there's a bit of a danger that this you know, net zero implies it's much more about behavior and much less about technology because this is known technologies. I think that's slightly dangerous for, 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 for both research and policy when the CCC says this is known technology. It's technologies which are currently, in many cases, some of these more difficult to treat sectors are far too expensive to be adopted at scale. So we need to bring, cut the, and the innovation is, is very much about getting things uh, demonstrated. Decarbonizing heat is at the moment looking much more expensive than, or well, the options for decarbonizing heat look a lot more expensive than our current ways of uh, supplying heat to lots of buildings in Scotland and others. So even uh, buildings efficiency needs a lot of technological innovation. So the committee did actually look at this, and I'm not, I wouldn't uh, reliably uh, use these figures, but they suggested that technological solutions were about 40%, behaviour change was about 10%, and the rest was combination uh, of both. I, now, I think we have to kind of, you know, that, that's... Uh, very broad brush, but I think we can't take our eye off the technological challenge. And I, I know that's difficult because some of the technological challenges are things that require a lot of international work on CCS and things like that. But Scottish government have to be careful um, in, in not taking its eye off that and thinking about infrastructure spend appropriately. So there's a, there's a good alignment between infrastructure spend available in Scotland and the climate change plan. So a massive role for the UK government in this as well. For, so for something like the decarbonisation of the gas um, network, yeah. um, th that comes back to that whole thing of we haven't heard a response from the UK government yet. Yes. Yeah. And that's going to be key, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. So we, we're expecting uh, a heat strategy uh, next year from both UK and Scottish governments. And they have to be aligned. So, um, but I, my point was really that there is quite a lot of infrastructure, infrastructure spend happening now in Scotland. We have an infrastructure commission and uh, infrastructure programmes. We have, um, you know, uh, significant amounts of money which can be leveraged with UK money, but that has to be directed appropriately so we can find out uh, more about how do we get the cost of uh, low carbon heat, hydrogen, CCS. I think Scotland has an opportunity to, to attract UK funding by leveraging its own spend in those key areas. Okay, Jim Ski. Yeah. Okay, and, and just to, to follow on what Mark has been saying uh, by taking a kind of systems uh, view on this, I mean, if we recall the 1.5 degrees report from IPCC, which I was involved in, then the way that that has moved into the Committee on Climate Change report, I think very much the message is because of the level of ambition that you're looking at, there's really nothing that you can leave off the, off the table. And I don't think then you can say it's either behaviour or we can do carbon dioxide removal. The ambition is such that we need everything. Uh, to support uh, Scotland's uh, current 90% uh, greenhouse gas reduction by 2050, there was a scenario that was called ambition. Uh, the new report has a scenario called further ambition that gets us to 96% and uh, a, a scenario called speculative, which is needed to get to the 100%. So it's really giving you the signal, nothing that can be left off the table. And my kind of view on is that the or is probably the most overused word in this debate. It's and, 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 uh, when, it, when it's uh, coming to the different measures. One thing that I would, would flag up, and it's to pick up on both the behaviour, which I entirely agree about, and Clive's one on nature-based solutions. The report also talks about uh, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, which is a very difficult uh, issue to talk about. And it also talks about direct air capture of carbon, which it suggests could be located with bioenergy, with carbon capture and storage, in order to take advantage of, of, of economies of scale. And one of the reasons, as I understand it, that the committee argued that Scotland could be more ambitious than other parts of the UK was greater access to these particular approaches, technologies in Scotland. So I'm not commenting on you know, the, the feasibility of that, because the, joint, uh, the, you know, the Just Transition Commission, we are specifically asked not to talk about the ambition. That's not our job. We are to think about how you get there and the fairness. But it is, I think, something to recall that what is differentiates Scotland from other parts of that U the UK is that greater access to potentially to carbon dioxide removal. And I think we need to keep that in, in mind as well. Okay. Uh, Tassin Jeffrey. 
Um, I just come back to the, the, the question that was posed. I, I completely get the need for different mindsets to come together um, and to, to, to brainstorm where we're at just now. I think one thing as policymakers, we, I think what we, we shouldn't do, we try not to do, is to assume that we have all the solutions. Um, and I'll just give you a very quick classic example of that, green infrastructure. We have researchers working on green infrastructure in poor, some of the poorest parts in Glasgow, um, and the communities in these, um, in these areas actually don't want green infrastructure. They don't want to have trees planted on, on their doorstep, and you know, policymakers are sitting around the table you know, wondering, well, why not? That's the most obvious solution. Um, but we, when you look further into it, it's, it's to do with issues about security particularly for women and children, these, you know, parklands are not lit. It's unsafe to go out. It encourages, um, you know, alcohol and drug abuse and so on and so on. So it's those issues that are beginning to come to the fore, which everyone's sitting around the table thinking, oh, well, we, we had no idea that those issues were coming up. So I think we mustn't underestimate, you know, uh, you know that we mu mustn't overestimate that we have the solutions and they are the, the, the definite solutions going forward. Um, and so I think there's a real critical issue to, and, and the need to look at co-designing and co-developing solutions with, with communities. Um, but also we mustn't, going back, going to the point about technology, I think we mustn't uh, underestimate the value of small scale solutions and low cost solutions can ha that can have significant impact to um, reducing, um, uh, you know, uh, to encourage behavioural change and bringing down sort of, um, uh, how we're dealing with our, with our climate. I think there's a lot of merit in that rather than always going for the, the high end, high cost te technology development, which there is a place for, but I think we mustn't underestimate the small scale um, yeah. things that we can put in place. Clyde Mitchell. To answer Stuart's question directly, we, we don't have enough planet <laughs> to do all of it by um, carbon sequestration. We'd need about three probably to do it that way. Um, so mo the bulk of the effort has to be on removing, reducing emissions that are going into the atmosphere in the first place. Um, but it's also clear that we need, we need to use the land care carefully to kind of close down the, the carbon cycles that we've exploded over the last few decades in particular. Um, and there are other kind of key nutrient and, and geochemical cycles around nitrogen that are, that are key to this as well. Um, the other um, aspect of that I was going to mention is that um, technology, so sorry, peatland restoration is really good for keeping carbon in the ground and, and sequestering carbon in, from the atmosphere. It also helps to regulate water flows and reduce flood risk and so on. Blue carbon would be another example where things like kelp beds are good for sequestering carbon, but they also dampen wave energy and reduce coastal flood risk during storms and so on. So again, I re-emphasize the point that it's both adaptation and mitigation and state of nature all together. And the final point I was going to make about technologies recognizing they're important and I think reinforcing all the points that have been made around the table is that inevitably technologies drive behavior change uh, and it's really important to recognize that I think particularly when we're talking about large-scale technological interventions we need to think carefully about what kind of behaviors are they going to stimulate as, as a result of those technological interventions and how are they compatible with with net zero and, and addressing UN sustainable development goals. Okay, David Ray. So, yeah, going back to the, the expertise, Stuart, and I think in terms of I mean, my, my earlier point about needing more skills and more capacity, we need that. But we have, we've got a wealth of expertise in Scotland. I mean, we are, the Committee on Climate Change talked about how we're ahead in terms of our emission reductions and in terms of our capacity to deliver, to deliver more. And part of that is the, the expertise we've got in academia, but also in our practitioners from our farmers through to the oil and gas sector, for instance. So I think in terms of that expertise, we're a good way along the line. There's a real danger of silo mentality, though, where we break it down and say, you know, so my, my specialism is agriculture and land use. But if I just look at that and don't talk to Jim, for instance, then there's a real danger there of unintended consequences. So I think um, we do need to do everything, like, like uh, uh, Jim Ski laid out. It's and 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 and. But that must be um, looking at the system and looking at those unintended consequences uh, rather than because some of the mistakes we've made in the past, particularly in terms of afforestation of peatland uh, for other objectives, um, you know, they, they were made in a, 
in a context where the whole system wasn't really being taken account of. So there are dangers there, certainly, if we just rely on um, siloed experts. And Rachel Hill. Um, I think we can couple uh, sequestration and mitigation. I think it would be useful to do so in certain sectors where behavioural change has so far been hard to achieve and where there are uh, fewer techni technological solutions, certainly in the near term. So the obvious example is flying. Um, and I think we can actually directly link um, Pay payments, extra charges on those kinds of behaviours and say that those are necessary because in order to achieve net zero emissions we must sequester the carbon although it would be more useful in a public um, uh, forum to frame it as the pollution. Um, so you know, we are asking you to pay extra as a fair measure to, pay, to help to reduce the pollution it, you know, through planting trees or whatever. So to actually link them rather than to play them off against each other. Although, as you'll have noticed in my response, I've said it's quite important, I think, not to frame that as an offset. Because once people believe that their behaviour can be entirely offset, uh, that might actually have a... a, a um, might actually encourage people to even feel that they can fly more. So I think the framing will need to be something like reduce the effects of your pollution. Um, so not, not completely offset it. Uh, and not make it, not use these sort of terms like carbon and so on, which don't resonate so much with the, the public, make it about pollution. So that also requires whatever uh, revenue would come from that kind of activity would have to actually ring fenced into... Yes, that's what I'm suggesting, yeah. that, that actually that would be uh, probably necessary for certain sectors and, and could be useful in encouraging... Um, more positive views of it, although there is research in Germany which shows that um, people lack, lack trust in whether it's ring fence, so there needs to be real transparency about it. Yeah. Okay. Um, John, you had a question. On oh, just a very brief point, uh, Karina, thank you very much. It was about um, Rachel's point and taking people with us, and one of the you said that the polls are very much in favour of this, but I think one of the hard-to-reach groups of people might be the elderly, um, and people are although <coughs> are living longer and longer, and, and I think behavioural change will be much harder to deliver in the elderly. I'm probably the oldest person in this room, maybe not completely, but... <laughs> well, but um, I, I know just from... the. My own experience of my parents and others that they don't people don't want to change as they get older, and, and therefore, and I'm disappointed to hear what Mark said about only 10% of this solution to this problem is is going to be behavioural change, and 40% um, might be um, technology, as it were. Um, I would rather hoped it would have been more behavioural change could have been more, and therefore, and that takes me into modal shift. You know, uh, could we could you speculate on modal shift? how we're going yeah. to deliver that, because I do think uh, public transport has been kind of overlooked in, in much yes. of our discussions. Yeah, so I, uh, I want to uh, sort of refer to, to the committee, because that, that is not my analysis at all, of course, that's the analysis of the, of, of the committee. Now, whether you, what one derives from that number, because it does sound disappointing, is either we're underestimating hugely the potential of behaviour change, or behaviour change is a lot more difficult to put into practice for all kinds of social, political uh, reasons. Um, I, I, and I, I think... Uh, I, don't, I don't think the committee would... So the other 50% uh, of, of the change is what they call in combination social and te technical... Behavioural and technological change working in combination. So I'm not disagreeing with anyone. Uh, I agree very much with Jim about this being and rather than or. But I do think the, uh, there are challenges. So we did some work. Uh, one of the other jobs I have is with the UK Energy Research Centre, and we did some uh, survey work on UK-based uh, energy experts and stakeholders about where they think decarbonisation is going to come from for the, from, for the different sectors. And um, for transport, the, the, the vast majority of people thought that, uh, electrification of the vehicle stock was going to be the huge kind of... Uh, route to, uh, to decarbonising the uh, um, uh, individual uh, consumer transport stock, uh, private vehicles. They, there was the evidence or, or their the expert views about the contribution of modal shift was very mixed. 
Uh, there were lots of experts who were saying modal shift is going to be hugely important, and there are transport experts who believe that modal shift is going to be hugely important. Others are, are skeptical about the role of modal shift, and often the reasons for that are because it's politically and in policy terms quite difficult to how much you force uh, uh, behaviour change in, in you know, all kinds of parts of the sections of, of the population, not, not just... Uh, uh, the sort of leading edge. Uh, so I, 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 I understand your point there about the elderly and so on. I, I'm not an expert in this area, but I, I think one, one would have to kind of uh, look at, at, at sort of evidence. One other thing I'll just say is, is that the committee did some really good analysis of which policies have proven effective to date on the transition. And it's a really nice mix because it's about carrots and sticks. They, they uh, discuss the role of subsidies for learning for, for expensive technologies. So the reason why offshore wind is, is now a lot cheaper is because subsidies have provided lots of learning. It's also provided uh, competition amongst producers, and so that auction system that we use in the UK has proven really successful. That's been a huge kind of... And the committee suggests 70 gigawatts. I mean, a massive expansion of offshore wind is necessary, doubling of the electricity system. The other contributors have, have been tax, landfill tax, getting emissions out of waste, uh, the way, and that's been hugely important in Scotland as well. And the other thing is regulating things out. So where there's a, a next stage technology that can be brought in, and the example there is condensing boilers and, and not allowing uh, conventional boilers to be, to be built anymore, to be installed. And those three things together have made huge strides. They've, they've you know, massive amounts of, of CO2 no longer emitted through just those three measures. Okay. Mark Ruskell. Yeah, thanks, convener. Um, I had quite a technical question, actually, and, and it's about the bill, and it's about the decisions that we need to make, particularly about interim targets and need for action in the next 10 years. Um, the Climate Change Committee has obviously produced their report. Within that, um, they provided some analysis around peatlands and around how we view peatlands at the moment within the inventory, whether we see them as um, relatively carbon neutral or actually a, a, a type of habitat that could be significantly contributing uh, you know, more than we perhaps had expected in terms of carbon emissions. Um, and that obviously has quite a, a, a change in terms of the assumptions around the target that we should be putting in place. Um, I think their, their advice is to uh, effectively uh, set a target based on a revised inventory rather than the current inventory which is in the bill and if it was based on the current inventory that was in the bill then we would be setting higher targets than what they initially had recommended. Um, so I wondered uh, what, was, what were the views uh, around the table on that and perhaps separate to that you know, a number of the submissions have mentioned blue carbon, wetlands, um, kelp forests, Kamina knows I'm a big fan of kelp forests, um, and a range of other habitats. I mean, this is an entire other form of habitat which we don't really know that much about in terms of whether it's currently sucking up carbon or whether it's releasing it. So what, what, do, what do people think about how blue carbon will be treated going forward? Could we get to a point where we have to revise all the inventories again because we just suddenly found out that actually our oceans are emitting far more than we thought, or actually our oceans are sequestering far more than we thought? So it's kind of two technical questions there. Apologise for the technical questions, but they're, something, they're very important because it absolutely comes down to the decisions that we need to make about 2030 and the other targets and what amendments, if any, we're going to put into the bill. Do you agree? So, great questions both, Mark. I love technical questions. So, on, on the peatland inclusion, um, I think we need to go with that advice in terms of including the peatland emissions, which are a substantial uplift in uh, the Scottish account. Um, and that's because only about a quarter of our peatlands are undamaged or have been restored. So, I think it's, it's kind of taking the, the hit now to set a baseline which allows us to then show action. So peatlands at the moment are, in Scotland, a net source of CO2. And even if you, if you look at the Committee on Climate Change's kind of um, 2045 target, they're going to remain a source of emissions, but it's going to get much smaller through restoration. So I think that's, it's, it's being honest in terms of how the atmosphere sees CO2 is the key. You know, our accounting is 
is all well and good, but it's you know, actually how is it contributing to warming? So I think they need to be into, in there. I think our science has come on leaps and bounds in terms of how well we can monitor, report, verify um, the emissions now and how changing uh, mitigation, uh, mitigation action can change those emissions. On the other ones, in terms of revising, there, there will be revisions in terms of national greenhouse gas reporting, changes in global warming potential factors, and things like blue carbon. And I think that shouldn't stop you as a committee and uh, as a parliament from uh, taking the advice and acting on it. So in terms of things like blue carbon, that might well be a larger sink than we think, or it might be a source, just as you suggest, Mark. Uh, but that shouldn't stop acting on the advice as it stands. And I think in terms of, again, going back to that research base we've got in Scotland, actually, we're very strong, and that is an area where a lot of us are, are focusing our attention is on the blue carbon and quantifying that so we can get it to the stage that we're now at with peatlands of saying, right, can we include it and how can we manage it better? Clyde Mitchell. Thank you. Yes, I mean, I th very much kind of echoing what, what Dave has said. Um, it, it's always going to be more difficult to measure emissions from land-based sources than it is from a pipe um, just because one's a pipe and one's the land. And emissions um, in land-based settings will depend very much on the context in which they um, sit in different parts of the country. Um, it's going to be very difficult to draw a kind of a hard and fast rule that applies to everywhere in the country. So I would certainly see, as Dave has said, the, the need to, to restore peatland is clear that um, if we don't, then they just contribute more and more carbon to the atmosphere and, and the atmosphere doesn't worry about how we account for these things. Um, so I think that's, that's essential. On the, on the blue carbon side, um, we're still working through the inventory to find out just how much there is and where it is and sediment sources are probably going to be the, the largest of that in the end, particularly in the sort of fjords and locks of the west coast and so on. Um, so and we need to understand better, you know, what, what the consequences of that for how we manage inshore waters and, and associated um, uh, stocks of blue carbon. And the way that they not only store carbon, but as I said before, with kelp forests, reduce wave impacts during storms and so on. Um, so, so in many ways, I think the uh, measuring all of that is probably going to be cruder than it is for pipe-based emissions. Um, so we probably need to see... The, the land and sea as a kind of insurance, really, stuff that we need to do to keep, the, to keep green, greenhouse gases where they should be in the ground or in the sea, but focus our efforts on, on reducing the emissions from fossil fuel sources that we are burning. Yeah. Rachel Hale. Uh, I want to speak, please, to the, uh, the interim targets part of your question. Um, Yes, the inclusion of peatlands is important, but the new inventory um, actually uh, presumably unintentionally means that the interim targets, the advice for an interim target of 70%, is actually uh, lower. Um, and we can't be going backwards on um, commitments. So the CCC state that that target um, uh, in the current inventory method would equate to 76% by 2030. So I would say 76% as a target for 2030, 96% uh, by 2040, um, as they've stated. Uh, would be the equivalent, is the minimum necessary. Um, you have the advice, the report that Kevin Anderson produced about what Scotland can do um, a few months ago. He was, uh, his advice equated roughly to, I think it was 86% by 2030. So, um, yes, I think the interim targets definitely need to be more ambitious than the, the ones that are currently proposed, for which there is no scientific ra rationale whatsoever. You know, they simply took a straight line uh, and, I mean, I understand why they had to do that. They, they didn't have time to do that, but obviously that's not evidence-based uh, policy-making, and I, I would have thought the government would be slightly embarrassed to say, well, we've set our targets on the basis of how a ruler fits on a graph. So I think it is, um, yeah, <laughs> more ambitious interim targets, really necessary also for the, for the point of getting out of the blocks fast, as we discussed earlier, um, because I think... Whatever target, what the, the target that's enshrined in the bill, if it is zero, net zero by 2045, that needs to be seen as a starting point. And I would be hoping to see that whoever announces that to the media is making a commitment that that will be revised as we see how it works out with an intention to actually bring forward that net zero date if progress should prove faster than expected. Okay. Jim Ski. 
Yeah, yeah, just to say on, on the inventories point, and it's worthwhile saying that when an inventory methodology is revised, that doesn't just affect the emissions in the current year, it affects emissions in the base year as well. And Scotland moving towards percentage reductions, it actually makes these more robust against inventory changes than, than would otherwise be the case. So I think that's a point uh, worth making out. On the question of the prospect of future inventory changes, I had the misfortune to be at the approval session for the latest version of the inventory guidance of IPCC about three weeks ago and, and painful it was indeed but just to give an example of the kind of changes that you might see uh, the new guidance includes guidance on how to deal with emissions from flooded land now why that would directly uh, have an implication for Scotland is if you ever wanted to do hydroelectric development any creation of new surface waters like that would have implications applications for the inventory. So these are the kind of things that you might see coming through in the future that would expand the scope. And worthwhile saying that, uh, I hate to say this, but there's an almost a theological debate that goes on between what is natural and what is anthropogenic. And a lot of the ocean stuff is essentially seen as natural, not, and not as anthropogenic, and would not fall within the scope of the inventories, at least at the moment. Attention. I totally agree with what Dr. Rachel Howell said, that we really need to have the strongest targets possible um, and, and obviously include uh, peatland restoration. Be honest about the emissions that we've had since 1919 before um, as soon as possible so that we can really make changes and uh, incentivise uh, land use change. And it's really important because I think the, the, the IPCC report on 1.5 was very clear that we need to keep to 1.5 and not have an overshoot and go beyond 1.5 before bringing us back to 1.5. And that's really important for wildlife, which is very vulnerable to, to temperature change. I think the, the committee's report um, talks about, you know, has a kind of a headline saying every degree matters. I would say that every tenth degree, you know, one tenth of a degree matters for wildlife because they are so vulnerable. Not every species acts in the same way. Not every species is as vulnerable as others, but some really are very vulnerable. So we cannot, we need to go as fast as possible, as soon as possible like you say, you know, sprinting out of the blocks, uh, and this makes a difference. Um, and, and of course, yeah, it's, it goes back to your point, Mr. Stevenson, about, about sequestration, and we need to make sure that we are you know, doing as much as possible, not just for CO2 mitigation, but for the hard to think, do things that are, involve biological processes like nitrous oxide and, and methane, which comes often from farming, and balance those, so do as much as we can with sequestration but as, and reduce as much and really go for that untapped potential in farming uh, and just quickly you know, expand upon that using the land use strategy that we already have to plan some of those interventions and make that map planning so we know which farmers can do more on sequestration and which more on, on efficiency measures and, and how much you know, dietary change can make a difference and then use what's coming up with you know, post cap funding, how we support farmers to, to to pay for public goods, you know, not just for food production, but also for sequestration. That's really important because some of them will need that support to keep going to, for that, for that, um, uh, you know, for that fair policies to make sure that they can continue to to work the land, but but be paid for for public goods. A number of the members wanted to come in on certain points, but I'm going to go to Ben Wilson first. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to come in on the point of the interim target, which I think is a really important one, in particular for SCIAF, who are concerned with the impacts on the Global South. I think, just following on from what, from what Dave Ray said, um, it's the atmosphere, how the atmosphere sees these emissions, which is really important. Or you could say it's how uh, the Global South sees the impacts of these emissions, which is really important. And therefore, we need the best and most accurate accounting and the strongest target based on that best and most accurate accounting by 2030 in particular. Just on 2030 in particular, I think it's, it's already been said by a couple of colleagues, but you know, the, the point of this CCC report was um, to respond to the IPCC special report on 1.5. And that report was unequivocal that we need 1.5 if we are going to protect developing countries from the greatest harm which is possible, and that we could reach 1.5 within 12 years. However, what that CCC response was not clear on was what Scotland's fair share of a contribution towards holding to that 1.5 temperature goal was by 2030. 
It was clear what its view on an equal share, a fair share of Scotland's contribution would be by 2045, and that was net zero, but not on 2030. And lastly, can I, can I just say um, that uh, uh, some of the things that we've been calling for as civil society is to make sure that this bill um, doesn't just set the targets that we need to reach, but also sets the, the principles which we need to follow to reach those targets. Um, and I think when it comes down to conversations like this, that becomes ever more important because this piece of legislation is going to direct the targets that we set up until 2045 and perhaps even into the future. There will be changes in those next 20, 30 years, like inventory changes or whatsoever. And so therefore, it's crucial that now, whilst we have the opportunity, we make sure that it's explicit in the bill how, what principles we should be following to achieve those targets. Okay. Um, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, convener. And I'd like to focus our minds back briefly on, uh, on behaviour change and ask two questions. Um, how important in framing is framing the arguments for behaviour change to take society with us, such as um, on climate justice and intergenerational justice? Um, I'm not going to go into highlighting issues around climate strikes and, 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 and those issues, but how, how important is that? And in terms of specifically regulating things out and, and the shifts that need to happen, such as modal shift, what support do um, anyone around this table this morning see as appropriate, both in financial and advice terms, particularly for individuals and communities where um, there's a lot of people on low incomes? Can I have a supplementary on to the back of what Claude, because one of the things that I was conscious of, it was a very interesting statistics about the Dutch investment per person of 35 euros a year on cycling infrastructure, but the communication of the health benefits and the longer term impact of that in terms of like health spend was like 19 billion. How are we going to start to communicate that short-term investment in things into long-term savings and even in an economic basis, but also in a kind of well-being basis as well? So that kind of fits neatly into what Claudia, I guess, is asking as well. Anyone want to tackle any of our thoughts on that or questions? Tassine Jaffrey. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a... Uh, uh, that's a, a good, really good question, and I think framing the argument is really important um, against the, the definitions of, of climate justice, but not just justice, but looking at the injustice aspects um, of the impacts that climate change will have on the poorest and most vulnerable if we don't address the issues of you know, the impacts it's going to have on people um, at all levels of, of society. Um, and I think the question about financial support is really important. There was, um, well, the, the UK House of Commons published a report on International Development Select Committee. They were looking at aid spend across um, their, their, their programmes. Um, and they've recommended that using a climate justice framework will be really important to help looking at how that, that spend is, is dealt with. So although we're not looking at international development spend, we're looking at a different pot of money here. The framing of it is re of, of using climate justice is really important, but also to ensure that the financial support is there to enable the poorest and the most vulnerable people to adapt because they're the ones that don't have the capacity and the ability to adapt as readily as others might be able to. So, you know, on, on one hand, you might have people that can put solar panels on the roofs, but other people in society just can't, can't do that. So I think it's really important, it, the ask that we have of our community, of our society, and the expectations that we have, we can't expect everyone to adapt, and there's limits to adaptation in people's ability to adapt. So we need to look at that carefully, I think. Um, just going back to the question on the health benefits, I think communicating the, the, the message, the, the, the broader message is, is really important. Um, and I think it relates to the point, um, Mr Scott, you made about the elderly and kind of all of these things are packaged together. Um, and, and the question that comes to mind is what's it's got to do with me? Why do we need to change? What's in it for us? This is a problem that's happening and it's elsewhere. A lot of people in Scotland don't really connect with what's happening in terms of a change in climate. <clears throat> and we need to really think about how we communicate that message out. Um, one of the interesting things that was in the news, um, I think it was last week, um, the BAFTA, at the BAFTA Awards, there was an announcement there saying that they need to consider embedding climate change messaging into how 
uh, into documentaries, into soap operas, into, in, you know, into programmes so that people can connect with what's happening through different storylines because we've got to find a, we've got to find an inroad to doing that rather than coming up with bottlenecks and we need to ha um, you know develop that conversation and, and engage people to help us do that and not assume that we have the answers so there there are all of these things that are happening um, and with the health benefits I think I'd mentioned last time around the the World Health Organization had published there the 10 threats to Global Health Report, which came out um, just at the start of the year, which, which highlights that climate change um, is one of the, it's, it's the number one thing that's going to affect people's health. But if we don't address, if we do address it, the benefits could be benefits to our health. And if, if we're able to turn negative messaging into positive messaging, that is perhaps what's going to engage our society. Because I think people are generally fed up with negative messaging overwhelmed as well. and overwhelmed and it's related to um because we're working on mental health and climate change and justice as a program of work there are real issues to do with um eco anxiety um people are and 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 with, with school children as well people are really worrying about the impacts it's going to have personally to them and, you, and you're seeing that with you know all the you know the protests with, with the extinction rebellion but all the children that are leaving school and protesting you know they're really worried about what's happening and we need to take that away we need to somehow put that turn that on its head to say we in the Scottish government are really going to be dealing with this issue so our society does not need, need to be worried going going further. So the, there's a there's a hu that's a huge conversation, and I'm not sure we've got time in this committee to take that forward. But there's a lot that needs to be unpacked. I feel. Okay, Dave Ray. Yes. Dave Ray. Yeah. Don't touch. Don't touch. Um, yeah, just, just from the perspective, I guess. Um, so echoing the previous comments on, there are a lot of positives here. So there are a lot of positives in terms of uh, human health outcomes, you know, cleaner water, cleaner air. I think for a community that I work increasingly with, which is the land use and agriculture community, um, that community, there are a lot of positives in the Committee on Climate Change report in terms of um, negative net cost uh, emission reductions, particularly through nitrogen management, for instance. But I think most of us who, who you know, have neighbours who are farmers or maybe have farmed ourselves, know that the extension services in Scotland are not perfect everywhere. And the kind of change we need is going to require a huge uptick in terms of the, that kind of provision and also the quality of that provision. You know, what, what do we do? So we were talking earlier about how individuals, you know, they want to know what to do about climate change. But that, that applies even more so I guess for a lot of uh, a lot of farmers, you know, in terms of if they're going to, if the ex expectation is they're going to grow trees, that might not be an expertise they have, and they might, you know, it might be some real um, cultural historical barriers to them doing that. So having a lot of assistance with that is going to be key, and also in terms of the people who live on our land and manage it, not all of them are landowners, and so there's a real risk here that if you're a tenant farmer you're actually at risk of, of these of policies which could deliver in terms of carbon sequestration, putting at risk your livelihood and, and, and pushing you out of where you currently uh, live. So, yeah, I think in terms of the positives, there are a lot there. Uh, but for, I guess, all sectors, and I'm just talking from land use sector, um, we really need to get those uh, extension services, that information uh, out to everyone. Okay. Uh, Jim Ski. Okay, thank you. I mean, two, two points on behaviour. And uh, the, the first one is on this question of the links, say, between health and climate change mitigation. Because often it's described we take a behavioural you know, intervention and say it's a climate mitigation measure with health co-benefits. And I would like to raise the question about whether it might actually be portrayed the other way around, that it's a health measure with climate mitigation co-benefits. So, for example, if you're looking at changes in diet or changing transportation mode to be more active 
for walking and cycling, basically the message would be that this prolongs active life effectively. It benefits you, it benefits your family, and also you're, you're uh, you know, contributing to the collective good. So I think, we, I mean, I defer to colleagues like Tazin and, and Rachel here, but I think it seems to me how you frame that message might, might affect it quite a lot. And if I could wind back to one other point, which was the question as to why the CCC report only referred to 10% of change coming from behaviour. Now, I'm no longer a member of the committee, but I have a history with it, and I can recall the certain culture of the committee. It wants to be evidence-based and it wants to be quantitative. And it's much harder to gather evidence of that nature in relation to behaviour change, which is often qualitative in nature. And the message I would pick out that is that when we do have behavioural interventions, it's incredibly important to do ex post evaluation properly, to understand what made a difference and why one intervention was better than another. Because obviously we have climate targets that are framed quantitatively, but the behavioural evidence is qualitative. And anything we can do to bridge that gap, I, I think, would help us quite a lot. Rachel Hill. Uh, I think you're absolutely right, Jim. I think it would be helpful to um, frame certain measures as being primarily about health uh, with secondary climate change benefits. Um, for example, one of the policies that could be brought in to help with dietary change could be to um, ensure that in public institutions, for example, hospitals, prisons, so on, long-term long stay um, institutions, that um, there were far more meat-free options and that perhaps some meals there wouldn't be a meat-based option. Um, and I think that would, that there's a very clear reason to do that for health reasons, particularly in hospitals, but, you know, there's a kind of duty of care to prisoners to ensure that they're eating a healthy diet, and I think that would be a more <coughs> understandable and quite possibly more publicly acceptable than to say, well, we're going to um, put place responsibility for carbon reduction on prisoners who don't have a choice <laughs> than on uh, everyday uh, people, uh, public, public um, in their homes. Um, to go to your questions, Claudia, um, how important is framing the arguments in terms of climate justice? It's very important how we frame the arguments, and unfortunately it's, it's a little bit complicated because we need to speak to people's values, and people have different values. Um, there's an organisation called Climate Outreach that has done a lot of really good work about how to frame arguments to speak to uh, different parts of the political spectrum. So a framing of climate justice or environmental justice works very well for people who are centre left to left. It doesn't work well for people uh, on the other end of the spectrum or even centre right. Um, but they, ha their work has, they have done a lot of work on how to frame it for the, for the centre right. So there's going to be a, um, a slightly complicated need to have different kinds of messages for different audiences. Um, this doesn't mean we're telling people different truths, but we're just using Using language that is going to speak in different ways. Um, I wish I could remember off the top of my head some examples. I can't actually remember, but I think it's. I think uh, on the right, there's, there's things about tradition and responsibility. And for example, um, talking about measures that will protect our natural heritage um, is one that, that resonates more. Um, if the committee is, is interested, or if you personally would find it useful, I can certainly give links to those reports um, afterwards. Um, in terms of what support is. Um, is appropriate, um, particularly in terms of finances or advice um, for different sectors of society. You mentioned low income, and I'd like to come back to your question about uh, elderly. W one, one important thing to recognise is that, in general, there is a strong positive correlation between income and uh, carbon emissions, um, with poorer people, in general, having lower carbon emissions. So. The good news is that a lot of the behaviour change that we need to see is actually going to come from people who can afford in financial terms to make that behaviour change. What, we, what we'll need to do is to target advice and support um, for those behaviour changes that are going to benefit the poorest. So the, the people who, uh, who, there is a lot of variation between different income de deciles, and the people who are in the lower deciles who do have high carbon footprints, the primary reason is that they live in very hard to heat homes. In general, they don't own those homes, and so there'll need to be policies and or support, um, or, and support that uh, target the, the landlords, whether they're social or private landlords. Um, 
so that, so that those people have the ability to live in <laughs> well-heated homes and also lower their carbon emissions. In terms of the elderly, again, um, if we're talking about the, the real elderly rather than the recently retired, um, their carbon footprint is often uh, a bit lower than others because they are not so mobile. They don't tend to take nearly as many flights, particularly international flights. So again, the particular areas um, where behaviour change might be more difficult for elderly people will be things like diet uh, and also living in large homes. And there it might be that there is advice and support needed in terms either of perhaps some some encouragement, not forcing of course, but encouragement perhaps to consider uh, downsizing, but also to be more, to, to, to install and to be able to use smart heating systems and so on, and to recognise that if one wants to keep a large home with lots of bedrooms so that one's children, grandchildren can still visit and stay, there is actually no need to, to keep all of that heated all year round when, it, when the extra bedrooms are empty. So I think it's going to be really important to, to look at what are the particular sectors, what are the particular behaviours, but I do think there's really good news that actually where we can focus our, our attention first is on the people who have more um, ability to make changes because they do have... Uh, they're often um, better off and they're often better educated as well. Um, uh, and it's, it's, it's more about, as I said, making it more normal or cheaper or easier. Yeah, um, I just, I mean, I, I, I agree with what, what's being, being said there. I, I, I think it's important not, not again to kind of, uh, perhaps I introduced it, so I've not been particularly uh, paying attention to my own advice, but not, not to kind of bracket off either behaviour or, or spend on infrastructure and innovation because when one thinks about uh, cycling uh, or heat, uh, what makes uh, uh, low carbon options attractive is often kind of the kind of infrastructure that people can see outside their windows or the kind of options that are made available to them. So I, th I think we have to kind of understand that if we're interested in modal shift in transport, infrastructure spend is, is highly relevant to that. So let's look at um, the Low Carbon Infrastructure Transition Programme in Scotland. Let's look at other infrastructure spend available in Scotland and see how much of that we can see as, as being directed towards encouraging modal shift. I don't know what the figures are at the moment. It'd be interesting just to take stock of, of you know, how, how spend is being directed. Um, I think the same applies for heat. Um, I think we have to make affordable options more available over time. I think that's difficult at the moment. I, you know, I, I think that's well understood within, within research. That, so the Committee on Climate Change has uh, introduced a recommendation that no new homes be connected to the gas grid after 2025. So that's okay for new homes, but that's, that's a very small proportion of the overall building stock. I think we have to move to a stage where we're able to kind of regulate out the most, by far the most popular way of, of heating buildings over time. I don't think that can be done very easily, very quickly. And I think if we try to do that very easily, very quickly, we'll, we will cause uh, problems with um, uh, pe people being put in disadvantageous situations, the elderly, the vulnerable, and so on. So I think getting the messaging right on those things is really important. And often, regulating things out works really well when it's made rather less visible to people. So when the natural replacement of things like boilers happen and become more efficient over time because uh, less efficient uh, uh, technologies have just been regulated out over time, so it's not an option to the consumer. So I think there's an active, question about, an active question about how active to make these choices at the level of the household versus smart regulation by governments and regulators. And I think you know, a lot of good behaviour change happens because of the latter. Ben Wilson. I'll just come in quickly on that point about uh, the quest of climate justice, just to highlight that, that SCIAF and other organisations have been calling for principles of, of climate justice to be put on, on the face of this bill, and I think this conversation that we've been having here uh, demonstrates again the, the need for that, that we need to be clear about how we're going to apply the, um, how we're going to apply this bill in terms of policies. What we've all agreed is that this presents um, great challenges, but also great opportunities. And I think that there are the structures already through the National Performance Framework, which is underpinned by the SDGs, to evaluate those changes and to make sure that they are achieved correctly. But they themselves need to be underpinned by climate justice. I gather that there was a, a, some debate around the question of principles in the bill and, and, and previous uh, uh, evidence sessions. But again, I, I would just highlight that the, the needs for those principles to be there to make sure that we are enacting this bill in the proper way. And those principles 
Um, the, the, the principles that we are calling for uh, are informed by the, the climate justice principles of Mary Robinson, um, which are things like human rights, um, gender, intergenerational justice, which, which Claudia Beamish touched upon, uh, and the right to development. Because fundamentally, if we don't act on this climate crisis, the reason we're all here, we are undermining the right of other people in the world to access their basic human rights and to access the development. That's what the Paris Agreement is about, and the Paris Agreement is the reason that we're all here. Clive Mitchell. Thank you, yes. Uh, I think framing is massively important, as all the comments around the table all the way through the morning have indicated. Um, and I think that does go back to the earlier discussion about collaboration and who's in the room talking about the problems and finding solutions to them is vitally important. And, and I think I would emphasise in that the, the importance of involving young people in making decisions as well as all the other various people in societies who are affected by the decisions that we take. Um, also in that, I think, in terms of the quantification of costs and benefits, we have quite good methods, debatable, um, to assess the aggregate costs and benefits of various decisions. But most of the issues to do with the state of climate and nature lie with the distribution of those costs and benefits across people and societies, who wins and who loses. And I think we probably need to develop much better tools at evaluating the distribution of those costs and benefits in order to inform a just transition to a net zero economy. OK. Um, John Scott. Um, thank you, convener. And declaring an interest as a farmer, I just wanted to go back to Jim Denshin's point about land use. And I wondered what the views of the committee are on an idea that I had, uh, which was to uh, change the land class or develop a new land class of land, a climate change mitigation land class to essentially lump into one body, um, you know, peat bogs, forestry, um, and all of these potentially valuable assets in terms of climate change mitigation and and have that as a, as a positive thing for, for land use users and managers and how that might... Um, they then be targeted by those who wanted to support external funding that might perhaps support that. Just briefly, I don't want yeah. to. Jim Denshin. So I think it's really important that we we carry on recognising and, and educating. So it's about, you know, telling uh, and supporting farmers to understand what their land has to offer in terms of the carbon sequestration that they can do, be it agroforestry, which is more integration, or, you know, of, of carbon and food growing, um, as well as you know, some planting some trees or if they've got peatland to restore that peatland uh, or if they're on the coast, maybe doing coastal restoration. So it's about that. I wouldn't say that what we need to do is classify land separately. It's more about recognition. I think it goes back to my point about the land use strategy. It's really important to have an integrated approach. What we want to do is avoid this, um, what we've done in the past, which is saying this land is really good for arable and this land is really good for um, upland beef and this land is good for housing for example we need to and then therefore like looking and extending that to saying this land is really good for, just for sequestration we need to have much more of an integrated approach and farmers to realize that if they're not in area a they can still do something there's lots to do in terms of mitigation that isn't necessarily about carbon storage and sequestration and uh, a land use strategy which really uh, is used and works and with regional approaches um, could really help uh, those bodies and farmers who are in that region to, to drill down into what's really important, what's the priority in that area. And for some it will be, say in the flow country, it will be peatland restoration, because that's massive. In other areas it will be the opportunities for tree planting. But in other areas it may be really good for agroforestry. So you can direct the support and the advice and the funding into those areas. Um, uh, and I think that's really the way we need to go ahead. And we've already got a land use strategy you know, in Scotland, and it should be used much better. Clive Mitchell. Thank you. Yeah, I very much kind of echo what Jim said. I think I'd be cautious about introducing a kind of zonation in a crude, scale, in a crude way into how we use the land, uh, just reflecting simply on the zonation that's occurred through the planning system since the 1950s and planning around the use of the car. 
uh, and zoning for housing, zoning for retail, zoning for industrial and so on, has made it very difficult to get about towns and cities in anything other than a car. Um, so if we want people to be more active in their daily lifestyles and walking from A to B and so on, we, you know, we need to think very carefully about the granularity of different types of land use within a given space. And I think that applies equally to how we use the land for farming, forestry um, and, and nature and food production and so on um, to derive the kind of multiple benefits at a scale that can address adaptation, mitigation, state of nature and the, and the sustainable development goals. Okay. Stuart Stevenson had a question, but it uh, seemed like a long time ago, so I apologise. Uh, well, I've now got about six questions, but I well, won't, okay. convener. <laughs> I, 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 to one. It's all right, convener. Um, <laughs> although I will say I'm six years older than John Scott. Um, but, but, but I wanted to come back in particular on uh, Jim Ski uh, on uh, the change that is in the bill that's before us uh, from volume of... CO2 we're taking out and other gases uh, to percentages. And I just wonder whether, uh, speaking as a former minister who got hurt in political terms by changes uh, in the inventory, um, which damaged the apparent progress we were making, whether, however, that both the percentage and uh, the, the, the in inventory management actually conceal a fundamental truth, which is that the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere has to come down. And while percentages make it easier for ministers and policymakers to explain what's going on and what they're doing, it doesn't necessarily, it, it kind of hides the underlying reality. And I just wonder if the change, which I would, if I was minister, be almost certainly supporting, um, is con concealing that. And just before I go, the other one of the six, which I will say if you don't mind, is um, that old people can find good things to do that help them. Our heating bill is £700 a year less than it was. That's 1,300 litres less oil we're burning to heat our house, simply because we went from 200 mil to 600 mil in the attic. So I think there's lots of positives we can get old people on the agenda if we, if we look at uh, how we persuade people by good, valuable interventions that actually help and get people in the mood to do more. But back to Jim. I think that was a direct challenge there, <laughs> there Stuart. Uh, I mean, I, you, you've absolutely pinned it down because you know, if you're using percentage reductions, it's good for considering the amount of policy effort that needs to go in and keeping some stability there. But if you were to take a longer term view and think what is the, on a science based approach, how much carbon dioxide can we afford to put into the atmosphere, then the absolute quantities uh, would probably be the better way to do it. Now, I, I'm struggling to remember this, but I think you got advice from the Committee on Climate Change on how to handle uh, inven inventory changes, uh, which, I, if I remember, it was basically to say that over the short term, you know, maybe up to five years, uh, you should uh, look at compliance with targets according to the methodology in place at the time that the targets were set. But over a longer term time scale, you need to keep reconsidering the targets in terms of science-based needs. So that, that, I think, if I recall correctly, was an attempt to square the circle in terms of the dilemma which you've rightly put out. But certainly from the convenience of policymakers, the percentage reductions in terms of retaining the stability, I'm sure in your previous roles you will have uh, understood the potential advantages of that. For policymakers, if yes. not for the climate. Yeah. Um, final question from a member, and then I'm going to use the rest of our time just to ask if there's anything else that the, pa the panel... The, oh, no, Claudia said it's not your final question. Mark. Just a quick one. I, I know there was a number of reflections around uh, the issue of infrastructure and around potentially locking in particular behavioural pattern system changes. Um, I'm just wondering if there are thoughts on how the bill is currently constructed and how we do or don't look at infrastructure at the moment in relation to, to budgets and our assessments. I mean, it seems that we've got a, 
a system that's very much based at looking at the the kind of carbon of, of the concrete of, of building something, but not necessarily at its use going forward. So I don't know if there are, there are any views on whether the bill could be improved in that regard to give us a more accurate picture of what's coming when we start using what's being built. Okay, David Ray. So just, I mean, in terms of the consequential analysis, which is, is exactly as you uh, articulated, Mark, in terms of not just the embedded carbon, for instance, in a new road, but its consequence in terms of potential emissions change. We've got the, the ability to account for that. I think, not to answer your question directly, but more about the revisions to the climate change plan and lock-in, is you could look at that 4% difference in terms of 66 to 70% and say, well, that's, that's nothing for 2030. Surely we need more ambition there. But actually, for the revised climate change plan, it needs to take into account the lock-in issues in that the trajectory is now to net zero by 2045. So it's not just about that 4%, it's actually what decisions are made which could make zero by 2045 impossible. So actually it, it, it needs a wider look than just how do we make up the 4%. Okay. Jim Gensham. Yeah, just very quickly, I think that we need to embed some of this knowledge and stats into... Uh, perhaps not um, just this bill or other bills, but you know, right across the board. Uh, obviously, this this bill uh, and the climate change bill can really steer how that is done. And I think there needs to be something in the legislation which helps to create that, and make that happen, especially towards the towards the budget, where the budget really needs to you know look ahead and pay for things and, and really account for things. So that, like you say, we don't pay for something which is going to completely massive, you know, increase our our carbon budget in the future and make those sort of um, wrong decisions um, right down to you know how we look at uh, you know, a future agriculture bill and, and what's our land going to be how we're going to pay our farmers and that sort of thing so that we can make sure that the decisions in there are are, are, are becoming more climate beneficial rather than doing the opposite okay thank you claudia I, I, I thank you, convener. I, I think possibly uh, with your agreement, if asked this question, people could, if they wish to comment on it, they could perhaps comment on it in their final remarks, if they, rather than go go back again. Um, it's a, a very specific question. While I appreciate that this is a, a high-level targets bill, it does also, um, especially in relation to 1.5, which we've been exploring today, it does actually. Um, focus our minds very sharply, as we've heard, on, on policies. And I wonder um, if anyone on the panel wants to highlight any specific policies, just in, in a sentence or two, which they think are really significant. And I, and I give you one example, which I would appreciate a comment on, which is, does this in any way um, alter what we think about in terms of our procurement policies? But it, it's for the panel to say if there are specific policies they think we need to looking at and that might feed well into um, the climate change plan um, which will lead on from the bill and it's a great final question so i think i'd actually like to go around the table to our guests and ask them to say that a direct top line ask on policy change that claudia's asked for so um are you up for the challenge to see jaffrey what would you what would you like to see in the climate change plan and policy change <coughs> gosh Oh, I'll come back to you. If you can come well, back to me. Um, the way I'm thinking about that is, um, and it relates to your question earlier on, on, on framing um, and climate justice frameworks and so on, and it, and it may all just come together. My, my thinking is, I would, on a practical level, I would suggest the development of a framework, a climate justice framework, again, certain parameters, procedural justice, distributed justice, intergenerational justice, encourage the development of that sort of framework, look at the development of indicators of impact, measurable change, um, uh, indicators of impact and, and of change that we want to do. And if you package all that up, how that feeds <coughs> into um, the direct policy change that, that we're after. And I'm not sure whether it's a policy change within, um, co within communities, um, within that side of um, uh, that arm of government, whether it's something within there I would like to see um, that we could measure against to show that we've delivered change against this certain policy within that. 
Um, so, Skiaffer, a member of um, Stop Climate Care Scotland, and, and collectively, as the coalition are, are calling for, <clears throat> uh, for a nitrogen balance sheet to help us understand and to eventually deal with um, uh, agricultural emissions, but also action on housing. So, an EPCC, uh, uh, an EPCC target by 2030. Um, but if I could just quickly comment on a couple of other amendments, not policies, um, and I've already mentioned the climate justice principles, but I think this bill also requires a tightening up of some of the definitions, for example, around fair and safe. At the moment, it's very clear what we mean by safe, but not very clear what the bill means by fair, and we are calling for more equity in the bill. David Ray. So, uh, agriculture for me as well would be a key one in terms of where the current climate change plan isn't ambitious enough. And so I think that would be an area where, based on the Committee on Climate Change advice, it needs to be more ambitious. I think one of the things we haven't mentioned today is the rest of the world. So south of the border we mentioned a little bit, but where we are as a nation in Scotland, if we deliver even a proportion of this in the next few years, we will learn a lot of lessons and will be a fountain of information for other nations who are looking to see how they can do it as well. So we've got the Conference of the Parties um, next year, COP26, which will bring Paris into force and new ambition from all the nations. And I think uh, as part of these kind of discussions, but for the wider Scotland, we have a real role to play in terms of um, how other nations can decarbonise rapidly. And, and so we can move to that 1.5, because we certainly can't do it by ourselves. Mark Winskill. Uh, so my comments are probably more about the plan than the bill, I'm afraid. So uh, my, what, what's kind of exercising my mind at the moment is the six months we have from Royal Assent to the new climate change plan. And I think that poses a kind of challenge to policy, but also a challenge to us in the research community. Um, what I would like to see is a much more joined up approach to, to doing that as a kind of research policy business. Uh, I think six months is incredibly difficult. I know the work's starting now. Change yes. plan, not a yeah. new one. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, so this is maybe a, more, a more general point perhaps then, but I, I, I think there are challenges in bringing all this evidence together. There's been a lot of different kind of perspectives on the problem across the different parts of uh, uh, mitigation and adaptation today. I, th I think that's quite a formidable challenge for any kind of uh, analytical body in government or, or without. So I think we need a lot of transparency about the evidence. I think one of the points that came up in your... A session with the committee itself was that there's a lot of spend happening on innovation and a lot of it isn't finding its way into a kind of uh, public evidence base that we can use sensibly to, to, to understand you know, how, how, how much faster we might be able to go on interim targets and so on. I think uh, so that, that helps to address you know, what, what the challenges around lock-in and, and so on are, which I agree with. I think the other thing is how difficult it is for different levels of policy to uh, think about this problem. So local government is being expected to do, and local authorities are being expected to do a lot uh, in certain aspects of this, around heating, for example, and energy efficiency. I think that making their, their approach and response and investment consistent with the national approach is very, very challenging. I think, we, again, we need an approach to that which research can help address the both local level, national level and, and international. I think for bodies like climate exchange, that, that's very challenging. So I think we need to, to, to have a much more integrated approach working together on that. Okay. Jim Ski? Yeah, okay, thank you. I mean, I'll just use this to kind of highlight the work of the Just Transition Commission, because a lot of the conversation has been about communities and cons consumers, but I don't think we mustn't forget there's a work element uh, to this as well. So I'd just like to flag, I think, the importance of investing in infrastructure, uh, developing new supply chains that will be needed to actually uh, allow this transition to take place, developing new skills and transferring skills from industries that mo may go into decline. So this is really the core of the work, work, work of the Commission. And just to say, I think it's important also be to be joined up across different institutions in Scotland as well. So the work of the Infrastructure Commission is going to be important here as well as the Just Transition Commission. And I'd also flag the role of the National Investment Bank uh, as, it, as it develops. Uh, we're well aware, for example, that you know sister kind of national banks like KFW in Germany invest a lot 
in built environment, improving energy efficiency, building up supply chains with SMEs. And I think that's an important area to consider. So I think my top line message on policy is infrastructure skills uh, is going to be an important part of it. Rachel Hill. Uh, since you want a brief answer, I think I'm going to focus on the areas where I think there could be more ambition, travel and diet. Um, I think in terms of diet, I would be suggesting that you need to look at policies to ensure that people are eating healthy diets, which will also mean that they're eating more sustainable diets. Um, I've mentioned the possibility of um, regulation about what kind of offerings are made in, in public institutions. Um, my research recently has led me to be reading um, health-based papers about diet, and I've been really shocked to discover just, uh, just how problematic uh, eating red meat and particularly processed meat at the level we currently do is um, for health. Uh, this is, to me, it looks like it's the new smoking. Um, that there really is an extraordinary range of um, health conditions um, which are affected by that. So I think there needs to be serious attention paid and, um, and that will, yeah, that, that, that's very much a health issue as well as a climate change issue. Um, I think uh, the NFU is right to say that it would be wrong to try to reduce production of uh, meat uh, before demand has reduced because that would drive um, imports uh, and I think we're going to need to do messaging around diet which is about health but which is also about positioning uh, red meat as something that is um, that, that you want to be buying that, that if you're eating more plant-based meals a week that the ones which are meat-based can you can now afford to make sure that that meat is really good quality, really tasty, and therefore ethically produced meat. And that's where, actually, that could be very good for Scottish farmers. So positioning Scottish meat as really good quality and ensuring that the, the um, regulations around production of meat in Scotland are such that it is uh, ethically produced could be positive. In terms of travel, um, one thing that might be interesting would be to talk to the Welsh Government about what they're doing. Um, they've got this really interesting scheme now where lo all the long-distance buses across Wales are free to all users at weekends. There's nothing in their public messaging about why they're doing that. I think it would be interesting to talk to them about why they're doing it, uh, how they're affording it, and what impacts it's having. Certainly my experience of travelling around Wales has been that there's been a high uptake of buses. There was one route I was travelling on where they had to put two buses on at the same time because the first was so full. If that is people who are doing a modal shift, then that's really good news. If it's just people travelling extra, perhaps not, unless it is then leading to those people being more willing to take buses at other times. Okay. Jim Denson. Uh, thanks. Um, I was going to mention the nitrogen balance sheet. I won't say Ben stole it, but he's mentioned it already. Um, so I'll talk about afforestation. Obviously, that's really key within uh, the committee's uh, on climate change's report. Um, but we need to do better, I think, at understanding... The, 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 the mitigation potential of, of different trees in different situations, in different locations, on different soil types, and what the nuances are on that. Because at the moment, we tend to look at, well, I plant a Sitka, tree, Sitka spruce tree, and it grows faster, therefore it will sequester a lot of carbon. So that is true in some situations, but it depends where you plant it. And, and not all trees are good in the right, you know, in different places. So, for example, agroforestry, um, and integrating that within uh, food production systems isn't going to be all about Sitka spruce. It's going to be about other types of trees in rows, etc. So we need to understand uh, what those trees are doing in terms of, you know, actually sucking carbon out of the uh, out of the atmosphere. That's really important. So we understand more about how to uh, plant broadleaf trees better for the climate, um, as well as as conifers and uh, managing our existing woodlands better and protecting them. And finally, Clive Mitchell. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, I think from everything we've heard, for me, it's not about a single policy. It's about the whole economy approach. Um, it's about better integration. When we talk about infrastructure, it's about grey infrastructure and green infrastructure and how they work together. How we secure the investment in that, both from the public sector and the private sector, working together uh, towards a, a zero-carbon economy. Um, thinking carefully, this is a big governance challenge, I think, about who's involved um, in the decisions that affect them, um, particularly young people, thinking about the intergenerational effects, uh, aspects of this issue, uh, striving for multiple benefits, addressing mitigation, adaptation, and the state of nature altogether. And I think for any decision, what does this look like in a just net zero economy? 
I want to thank you all very much for your time this morning. I'm going to suspend this meeting briefly to allow the change in panel. Thank you, everyone.
Right. Uh, we continue taking evidence on the climate change emissions reduction targets Scotland built, stage two. Um, and this is our second round table today. Welcome to everyone that's come along for that. Uh, many of you will engage with the committee as part of our consideration of the bill at stage one. And we've got a good two hours to spend uh, talking to, um, I, I guess, our, our um, sectoral stakeholders. Um, and we'll do the same as we did in the first session. We'll go around the table and if we can, I, I don't think the members need to introduce themselves again, but if we can go around our uh, guests, starting with Jess Pepper, just say who you are, where you're from. Um, hi, I'm from Transform Scotland, the Alliance for Sustainable Transport, and we work on walking, cycling, public transport to make it affordable and accessible for everyone. Okay. I'm Morag Watson. I'm the Director of Policy for Scottish Renewables, which is the industry body for renewable energy in Scotland. Good morning. I'm Colin Campbell, representing the Scottish Environment, Food and Agriculture Research Institutes. Okay. Uh, morning. I'm Will Webster from Oil and Gas UK. Um, we represent uh, exploration and production companies uh, in the North Sea and contractors as well, and we have about 350 members. Hello, I'm Margaret Simpson. I'm here from the Freight Transport Association, uh, representing freight and logistics. Okay, thank you. Hello, I'm Andrew Midgley. I'm Environment and Land Use Policy Manager at NFU Scotland. Hello, I'm Elizabeth Layton. I'm the Director of the Existing Homes Alliance Scotland, and we are a coalition of housing, environmental, industry, and fuel poverty bodies all working to... Um, call for greater action to improve the existing housing stock to address fuel poverty and climate change. Uh, good morning. I'm Angus McCrone, Chief Editor of uh, Bloomberg NEF. We used to be called um, New Energy Finance, and we're a group of about 250 people within Bloomberg who research everything to do with a sort of low-carbon transition uh, globally. Good morning. I'm Andy McDonald. I head up the Energy and Low-Carbon Transition team at Scottish Enterprise. Okay. Right, and I guess... Um, oh. Dr. Casey. Apologies, Dr Casey. That's okay. I no just <laughs> got confused. On you go. I'm Diana Casey from the Mineral Products Association. Uh, we represent cement, lime, uh, concrete, dimension stone, silica sand uh, activities in the UK. Okay, apologies for that. It's just as well John Scott sat beside me. That's what I always say. Um, I'm going to put out, uh, I guess, a question about your reaction. And I would like to ask you to give a positive reaction. And what did you think of that you could positively do in your sector to help Scotland achieve the targets that have been uh, advised by the Climate Change Committee? So I guess I'll come back to you, uh, Dr Casey, and ask you first. Yeah, sure. So there's a whole range of things where we believe that the materials that our members produce can do to help um, and actually a lot of it wasn't in the CCC's report so it would be good to get that across now. Um, first of all uh, recarbonation is one thing the report mentioned enhanced weathering but um, actually recarbonation is the process where cement and concrete take in atmospheric CO2 throughout their life um, and permanently store it within the materials. So it's happening in our urban environments every day and at the moment it's not included in greenhouse gas in inventories but it's actually quite a you know it adds up to quite significant sums so that would be one way to help when you know including that would help us get to those targets um, the cement industry has already done a significant amount of fuel switching um, away from fossil fuels um, to waste biomass fuels, which is another thing that's not actually mentioned in the CCC's report. So we feel this is a very good use of biomass. Um, when it's already been through one cycle of its use, um, it can then go to the cement industry where it not only contributes to the energy, but any of the mineral or metal content, not in biomass, but any mineral content within that biomass is recycled in the cement product so it aids a circular economy um, another area where we feel our materials are really beneficial to reaching net zero is that heavyweight building materials uh, provide thermal mass which also wasn't mentioned in the CCC's report um, and that can significantly reduce energy uh, consumption in buildings throughout their life again um, one of the areas that 
uh, is mentioned, I think, is overheating in buildings, and thermal mass can really help prevent that in a passive way without requiring mechanical cooling. And of course, there are greenhouse gas emissions associated with mechanical cooling, and that again isn't included in the in the committee's report. Okay, Jess Pepper. Really welcomed the um, UK CCC advice and great to see Scottish Government respond so quickly and strongly to it, especially to put in um, a commitment about structural changes across the board and planning, procurement, financial policies, processes and assessments. That's all really important stuff too. Um, lots more similarly. Um, good to see good stuff in the report. Plenty more that we could be doing within the transport sector in Scotland with lots of multiple benefits and it's great to see that's such a strong theme um, in the sessions today. There's a big focus on electric vehicles. They have a role to play. Um, we would like to see lots more investment in active travel and the public transport system because of all the co benefits that that could produce for Scotland. So lots more positive stuff to say but this is a good start. Okay, thank you. Our members are extremely welcoming of the net zero target. It's going to be challenging. As the report said, we are looking at possibly quadrupling the amount of electricity we need to generate from clean sources. So the renewable energy industry stands ready to help meet that challenge. And as we've already seen, uh, with the falls in the cost of onshore and offshore wind, with onshore wind now being the cheapest source of electricity, with the right long-term policy environment, we can really achieve this. So our members stand ready to contribute to Scotland's net zero target and make Scotland a world leader in supplying our own energy needs from clean renewable energies. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> yes, very much welcome the report and the opportunity that it gives to actually have a refreshed thinking about how we do things. Uh, I think of the Safari and the institutes that represent the environment, food and agricultural sector have obviously been researching climate change and the issues around it for a very long time uh, and see this as a sort of a, a moment in time in which to actually think again about how we do it. I think in the environment, food and agriculture area, there is one that is quite challenging. There are, have not been huge amounts of improvements in the last sort of eight to ten years and that we need to have new ways of actually thinking about it. There's a huge amount of research that we're doing on improving the efficiency of our agricultural and food production systems and these are very aligned with meeting greenhouse gas emission targets but actually they're mostly incremental. We're also doing research on how do we alter our systems and have new systems of agricultural production, for example, using agroecological um, principles. And these are all, again, very aligned with how do we mitigate uh, greenhouse gas emissions. But I think we're also conscious that we need to have even more transformative ways of doing things. And what we are also able to do is to come up with new ideas about how do we grow food, for example. Um, there are new technologies available, indoor vertical farming, which is a necessity because of the changing weather that we're going to have, but actually has huge um, benefits in terms of environmental footprint and saving greenhouse gas emissions and can disrupt food supply chains, reducing food miles, reducing food wastes, and lots of other technologies that are coming along. And what we think is really important is these new technologies are considered because many of the projections in the report are about using existing technologies, but we think there are lots of new technologies that can also contribute to the future. Okay, thank you. Um, so our, on the, our reaction to the CCC report, um, I think we saw it as a really positive blueprint. Um, I think certainly we saw it as a, as a big challenge across the whole of the economy and society and to all sectors. I think it was an honest report um, and it was frank and honest about the costs involved um, across the board. Um, I think you know, from our perspective as the oil and gas sector, um, the, the projections for production and consumption uh, of oil and gas in the in the UK economy are actually fairly consistent with our own. Um, so we see things in two kind of time frames, um, one going off to around 2035, where we have our vision 2035, um, which is the you know to maintain uh, production from the North Sea uh, during that time. By 2050, the world's going to look quite a lot different. Um, so I think there was a recognition in the CCC's report around the the positive impact our sector can have to support the energy transition. We found that really important. Um, in terms of uh, what we can do as a sector, um, you know, the interesting thing about the CCC report is it saw a, a, an ongoing role for use of gas going forward in particular um, in decarbonised form increasingly uh, and what that then says about the necessity to roll out carbon capture and storage, uh, which was a theme that ran through the report constantly, um, which is one that puts you know, the oil and gas sector at the centre of this transition, uh, and we recognise that. Um, 
in terms of our own emissions, um, you know, it's and, and there was some sectoral analysis in the technical annex uh, across all major energy using sectors. Um, so our emissions are around 3% at the moment of the total UK um, CO2 emissions, um, whereas you know, from on the consumption of fossil fuels, it's about 60%. So, you know, we see the priority essentially is looking at how we go about how we use fossil fuels in the economy, not necessarily about how we produce those. Um, there's an important question about competitiveness there, in that if we unduly add costs and add requirements to our production sector, um, that will simply mean replacing indigenous production with imports. Um, so we think it's important to get the balance right in terms of what, what has the priority. Um, that being said, you know we will be under, you know, um, in we will be have incentives in the next 10 years or so to reduce our own emissions. In that um, we are covered like all industrial sectors by the EU emission trading scheme, and we expect some version of that to go forward. Um, that adds a lot to the costs of using CO2. So the incentives there, um, increasingly as the emission certificate price has been increasing sharply and the amount of free allocation is being reduced. That puts a lot stronger incentives on both our sector and all other industrial users. Um, so those things will all, um, you know, th th those things will naturally mean um, a, con a contribution continues to be made from our sector. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, the FTA very much supports um, the paper and, and what it's trying to achieve. I think it's important to point that out. Um, and our members themselves are, are very much already doing what they can with the introduction of the Euro 6 vehicles in 2014 on the, the heavy goods side. Um, our members continue to look at alternative fuel options. There is no definite answer with that yet, particularly towards heavier goods vehicles. Um, the freight and logistics industry is all about efficiency, so anything that re reduces costs and improves efficiency can only be good for the Scottish economy. And I would also mention, don't forget, that the freight and logistics industry, it doesn't exist for fun. I know that sounds a bit um, childish, but it's very much there to provide a service to everybody else, whether that's industry, business, or individual customers. And there are a lot of aspects to that. Um, and I think there are lots of different solutions that will work with different elements of the industry to help improve the situation. OK, thank you. Thank you. Um, NFU Scotland welcomes the report, and um, at the same time, we recognise the challenge that it presents to the industry. It's a, um, such a, a, a challenging uh, target for the industry that we um, kind of wanted to sort of define it. We wanted to recognise that you know, it marked a moment. It's kind of era-defining for Scottish agriculture because of the nature of change that will be required in the industry. And... Um, Ultimately, you know, we have to uh, we have to embrace this change, uh, and we, as an organisation, have committed to do that. Ultimately, we want to see uh, the farmers as part of the solution. We want to see farmers continuing to farm, uh, and, and quite often, at the moment, the way things get talked about, it's, it, it, it doesn't seem like that. And, but we want to um, make sure that the people are that, that the people on the ground are enabled to change and are part of the solution. So there's lots in the report that farmers and the industry can do. And uh, there's some uh, emphasis on the win-wins. There's the things that people can be doing that uh, saves them money and reduces emissions. But equally, we have to recognize that there's you know, significant change that in, in terms of dietary change or land use change, which uh, presents uh, you know, a real a sort of challenge to the industry. So I guess the positive thing that we sort of wanted to emphasize is that we recognize or, or what we see here is a collective challenge. Uh, it's, we have to work with government here uh, because um, yes, the industry can do lots itself, those win-wins to sort of save themselves money and to reduce emissions. But there's lots that's also being talked about which uh, really presents businesses with uh, high costs, you know, infrastructure sort of changes, those sorts of things. And we have to kind of work together to work out how to do this. And so, as, as an organisation, what we uh, had said we would like to do is, is kind of view it in that way, work with the government um, in order to sort of move forward in a way that the, the industry doesn't feel that its emissions reductions is just something that's been done to them. We have to kind of work collectively so that we've got the common objective and then work out how to get there and take the industry with us. And that's the best way to get there. And that's where we, we kind of feel that we can help in that regard. Okay. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, the existing Homes Alliance also very much welcomed the report and the Scottish government's de decision to accept the uh, Committee on Climate Change recommendations on, on the targets. Um, we, in terms of housing, uh, there is no doubt that it's, it's not only what housing can do in terms of supporting um, re reducing of emissions, but what it must do. The CCC's report said very clearly that we cannot meet climate objectives without major improvements in housing and also specifically without near complete decarbonation of the housing stock. So, so it's one of those things that is simply not an option. You know, you can't do, leave housing as it is and do transport instead. It has, it has, to, um, has to be tackled. The good news is that particularly in Scotland, we're not starting from a, a standing start. Um, so we can't, I don't know if there's mixing of metaphors, but we can be out of the box fast on this. We have a good infrastructure in place. Um, we have the Energy Efficient Scotland route map that is in place. We would argue very much that the, the targets, that, that route map needs to be revisited now to make sure it is uh, aligned with the new targets and that it will need to be accelerated. But we do have an infrastructure in place that is working on advice and support for homeowners on energy efficiency and decarbonization of heat. And, and also to emphasize in terms of the framing that was spoke, spoken about in the first session was that you know, with, with housing, it's definitely not a sacrifice. You're talking about an improvement in people's housing. You're talking about healthy, beautiful homes that are affordable to heat. They're warm, they're healthy, they're comfortable. So this is an improvement in people's, uh, their quality of life. Um, and, and in terms of things to do, the uh, CCC in their report, their housing report, they've got 36 recommendations, not all of them specifically to Scotland, but many of them apply to devolved administrations. So there's, there's plenty to get going with on, on housing. Mr. McClure. Uh, yes, thank you. So um, it's always good to has, have a business plan if you're in the private sector because uh, it gives you something to aim for and you, you may well make it. If you don't have a business plan, you, you probably won't as a, as a business. So I think in that sense, it's very helpful to have the long-term targets from the Climate Change Committee. I must admit, reading the report, I was kind of... Um, flummoxed a little bit by the, the sort of technology mix that they presented as, as being the future because it seems to me that um, a lot of this is, I mean, it's a global issue and um, what's really going to work are the technologies that prove them, them, themselves to be competitive on a global scale and um, those are the ones that will overwhelmingly be replicated in Scotland and um, in the UK generally. Uh, we, For instance, we're a lot more um, aggressive with our forecasts on future cost reductions for wind, solar and batteries than, than the committee assumes. Um, and also on, on EVs, we expect that to be, um, them to be a much larger percentage of the passenger car fleet and also the commercial fleet uh, more quickly than the, the committee's assuming. But on the other hand, um, some of, of what the committee is putting forward on carbon capture and storage, we, we really struggle to see that at the moment, unless there's a high carbon price, um, unless there's a sort of technological breakthrough. Um, CCS has been talked about for a very long time, and um, since I've been doing this job um, 13 years, it hasn't really advanced um, greatly. So we struggle a bit with that. Um, so I, I think I would emphasize the technologies where we can see a clear path to global cost effectiveness, um, some, in some cases already achieved, but with more uh, cost improvements to come. Mm. Uh, Ms. McDonald. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, I, I, to a certain extent, echo some of, of what uh, Angus McGrone said. Um, we welcome, certainly welcome the climate change plan update and the, uh, the, co the committee's work as well. Uh, it will accelerate and bring clear focus to a number of the things that we need to deal with. Um, it, the fact that it is cross-societal as well as cross-sectoral means that there is a broad engagement, which again should allow us to bring together all of the excellence in Scotland, the UK and beyond um, to address some of the challenges. And as we bring academic and industrial innovation particularly to bear, which is in our, our domain uh, within Scottish enterprise, 
uh, to try and find solutions with companies, then hopefully some of those will also be the solutions to some of the global challenges as well, and therefore can be internationalised and traded as well, so there will be an economic benefit from those services and products, as well as the obvious benefit to ourselves and society and as, as citizens here. Now, just before I go to Mark Roskill, just when, uh, we, in our report specifically, tasks the enterprise agencies with having a priority on low carbon enterprise and innovation. That is going to require maybe a different mindset. You know, innovation possibly doesn't isn't successful 100% of the time. Scottish enterprise prepared to accept a certain amount of trial and error? Uh, we've always been at the end where risk is high. That's That's been our function as part of the, as our share of part of the, the operation in, in innovation. So, yes, we're very aware that um, not every innovation will succeed, not every, every project will succeed. Um, that's the challenge of being the Economic Development Agency in that mix. Okay, thank you. Mark Ruskell. Yeah, I was reading the, um, the CBI submission, and you know, they were saying a lot of businesses are basically waiting to see what kind of technologies and innovations emerge, whether that's hydrogen or carbon capture and storage or whatever. Um, but you know, time ticks on, um, 10 years really, to make big transformative changes. So I'm, I'm just wondering, how do you, what do you see as the, the best mix in order to stimulate that innovation to start to answer some of the questions around which technologies, which big transformative changes um, should be pushed? I mean, is it, is it about allowing markets to effectively make decisions or if it is about the state taking a more active role through National Investment Bank or whatever, what does that actually look like? What, is, what, what, what does that involvement actually look like in order to drive forward that innovation with the private and public sectors working together. I'm very well aware that there's another evidence session in this parliament looking at the Scottish National Investment Bank bill this morning. So, mm. you know, there's, there's almost a bit of a crossover here in terms of, you know, other, other agendas. So your question, I suppose, is directed to Mr. McCrone, perhaps? Or well, anybody, that want, any, anybody, anybody that's interested to, in innovation yeah. and technology and, yeah. you know, there's a heavy reliance on CCS and hydrogen and okay. other interests around the Elizabeth table. So. Um, yes, if I can respond to that question in terms of, of housing, um, because there's been a, um, some caution from the Scottish Government in terms of accelerating progress on um, and standards expectations for improvements in, in existing housing because saying technologies aren't ready or you know we can't get ahead of the market and and so and, and also concerns there's not capacity or skills in the supply chain. So we did a survey of of suppliers and came back with response that said 90% of the suppliers think that EPCC uh, ban C is achievable by 2030 rather than 2040. And that is because they said the technologies to meet that C are available now. Um, and, you know, and that's really this accelerated action in the next 10 years. They say that we are happy with our current capabilities to meet EPC ban C. Now, need to realize that we are not inventing the wheel here. The technology has been widely used throughout Europe, but we remain miles behind and treat every installation as if it's the first ever. And so, so it's this it caution, I, I know I'm just speaking about this sector, but this caution that tends to drag progress rather than giving them what they're saying, the key success to delivery against the target is clarity and consistency. Set the target, confirm it will not change, and the supply chain will deliver. And so, sure, there, there is still room, plenty of room for innovation in the housing sector. But certainly in terms of a, a band C, the supply chain's message is pretty clear there. Uh, Jess Pepper? And then I'll... Yeah, I'd like to um, just look at, so I've talked about investment in our public transport system, and um, there's a good reason for doing that for a just transition so that everybody has access to better choices for their travel. Um, we need to decarbonise our public transport system and um, I'd draw attention to three modes that we could be looking at. This is a nation that makes and has great expertise in buses, 
and in trains and in ferries. Um, and we can afford to be much more ambitious, as I um, mentioned when we gave evidence before, in terms of buses. Again, buses are largely overlooked in the UK Climate Change Committee's um, advice. And actually, that seems to us a missed opportunity because investment in buses, as well as decarbonising, that's an opportunity to achieve real modal shift. And the big problem that we have right now is in transport that hasn't shifted in 30 years is road traffic. So, so to improve lives, to improve efficiency, to improve health and to, prove, to tackle inequalities, investment in buses is really important. We make buses, we can demonstrate and we do demonstrate globally um, leadership on bus manufacturing. We host two global bus headquarters and there's a massive um, contribution to make with some serious investment which also connects to everyday active travel when you're commuting and that is reducing risk of major diseases amongst all sorts of other health benefits. On trains, um, since we last saw you, we've been working hard with industry to explore exactly what the potential is in terms of decarbonising our entire rail network. And it's good news. Industry is, um, and rail experts, and you'll see some of this coming out across the UK, we've been looking specifically at Scotland, demonstrates that we could, should be aiming to decarbonise our entire rail network by 2030, that that's entirely possible with intercity routes and rural routes as well. So nobody has left out. This is an inclusive attractive um, system which everybody can have access to but the urgency to crack on with that rolling program is now it's not thinking about it and making plans and debating it further it's now we have secured ourselves 10 years by making the decisions that we made 10 years ago to electrify between Edinburgh and Glasgow and also to buy the um, the high-speed trains which are going now across Scotland, those won't be around forever. And that buys us 10 years of a window of opportunity to get in place decisions that will impact upon our rolling stock choices well into the next decades and possibly beyond 2050. If we are really smart and we invest in our infrastructure and we invest in our rolling stock, then we could be ahead of the game. And that brings with it transferable skills and employment opportunities and exporting that experience elsewhere. We've got a good track record. Sorry, couldn't think of another word. We've got a good track record on rail in Scotland and we need to crack on and invest in that. And what a great opportunity, what an attractive resource that could be for Scotland. Ferries as well, we need to be thinking lifeline services. We've got three hybrid ferries just now. What's the opportunity to look at investment and um, ambition there too? We talked about improving lives and uh, yeah, all the co-benefits, addressing inequalities, um, the efficiency for um, freight transport, for example. This is all important and um, reducing Providing other solutions, not just for passengers, but for freight. You know, we were seeing in the freight um, evidence that you know we could be shifting that onto trains. Absolutely, that's what we need to be thinking about, and we could be improving our railways to take more freight as well. So we've got the skills, the opportunity, improving lives. If we provide, and this is this is evidence on modal shift, if we provide quality, affordable, accessible alternatives, people will be attracted to them. We see that now with the 385s, the new Hitachi trains running between Edinburgh and Glasgow, that when they did the polling on whether people preferred them and it enhanced their journey, the answer was yes, and people are keen to use them. So real opportunities there. Just come back on something, Rachel Hill in the last panel mentioned easy and cheap. Now, if you live what I do, my constituents do, public transport is not easy, it's not cheap, and it's not particularly available. There's no, if there's no rail in Stuart Stevenson, I'll say it before you do, there was no rail in Stuart Stevenson's constituency of Ban, uh, Ban from Buchan. But there needs to be big infrastructure inv investment before what you're saying comes to fruition for rural communities. Yeah, yeah. We will, um, we're working on this with a costed and um, timetabled example of what, um, plan for what needs to happen between now and 2030 and looking to the future in terms of rail. We're also working with bus companies and our members in terms of what needs to happen on bus. For example, in terms of modal shift, what makes it easier, what makes it more attractive, where the investment needs to go to make it accessible to everybody. Okay, Murdoch Watson. Going back to Mark's question about innovation. So it's our members' view that the majority of the technologies that we need to meet our clean green energy needs already exist in Scotland. They are well established, particularly onshore, offshore wind, solar and hydro. 
Our members are also at the cutting edge of innovation around the new technologies. Scotland is a world leader in uh, wave and tidal technologies, particularly uh, the centre up in Orkney, who's developing things there. And we also have the world's first um, offshore floating wind farm. So these things are already in place. For further innovation to take place and for these things to come to market, the key thing for our members is that we need to have a long-term ambitious target and a stable policy environment. And if we have those two things, that is the space in which people have the confidence to invest and innovate and bring forward the uh, refined new technologies that we will need. Diana Casey. Yeah, I think um, in relation to this question, it's possibly um, CCS that's of most relevance to the cement and lime sectors in the UK. Um, and in terms of the mix, I think all, almost all of our members are involved in the sort of research and development part of CCS, so how do we capture the CO2 from the cement plants in the first place? Then, of course, we need government policy and intervention for the whole transport and storage part of that. I think the bigger problem we have at the moment is that we know CCS isn't a nice to have in the cement sector, it's absolutely vital. Uh, it's the only way we'll get rid of the process emissions. Um, and most of the cement plants in the UK are located outside of the main clusters. And of course, that's where all the focus is at the moment, which is completely understandable. But we do need a plan of how that's then going to be expanded to those more isolated sites. And it's something that I think it was a missed opportunity, to be honest, in the CCC report to start thinking about a plan to put that in place. Um, and then I think um, we also need... Um, so I've, sorry, I've mentioned transport and storage. Um, when you put CCS in place, it's going to double the operating costs of uh, cement production. So for those companies that move, or sites that move first, some sort of protection is going to be needed, whether it's through procurement, which I think was mentioned in the previous session, um, or some other tax break or something, because otherwise you would just go out of business by doing it. Andy McDonald. Pick up on that, on that point and around the, the, the innovation side of things. The, one of the big advantages of the changes that we're looking at now are that they are a whole system. So we've supported innovation work recently around um, hybrid ferry, for example, and then and now looking at hydrogen ferries, we've brought with partners funding from European programmes as well as UK programmes in to do that. But the, the ferries are being used as part of a broader uh, development of technology as well, and particularly in the case of the, the hydrogen ferry, which will go to Orkney, it's part of the much broader set of work that's going on on Orkney using renewables and the whole energy system there. It's a part of it that will be part of the, the mix and other things will generate the electricity, with renewable electricity, which will then generate the hydrogen, which will then support the ferry. So it's looking at those things as part of the whole system. Similarly, as, as Jess Pepper was suggesting with transport, we've begun with where some of the perhaps relatively easy stuff is around hydrogen buses, local authority vehicle fleets, but we're broadening that work out now. We have a joint plan and development with Transport Scotland, um, looking at rail, looking at the opportunities in Scotland to, to, to hybrid technology again, or to hydrogen technology ultimately, um, same in heavy, heavy goods vehicle transport as well. So looking at the infrastructure, looking at the opportunities, looking at where, for example, there are perhaps constrained wind developments which might provide the energy to allow us to, to resource some of that down a transport corridor initially, which looks at where currently electrification of the rail network hasn't happened, for instance, but also recognising the point that this has to be multimodal as well as, as, as intermodal or new modes, and that it has to be joined up and look at whole, the whole system. So again, we're trying to work with our partners in the likes of Transport Scotland and also in the travel and transport companies, in the bus companies, the bus builders as well as the development and, and running companies. Okay. Colin Campbell. Um, with reference to the innovation and the global competition, clearly a lot of things will be selected out by global competition, but I think what we need to think about is what's authentic to Scotland in terms of our natural strengths, and many people have made that point. And I think that's true also of the Scottish science um, system that we have. We are world leading in, in science, and that's true of the uh, Environment, Food and Agricultural Research Institutes. And to give you one example of that, we also need to think about how our natural assets play to those technological strengths. So one of the th two of the things that we're really still very abundant in is renewable energy and water. And these are two of the natural assets that we still need for growing food. Uh, water is going to be very scarce in the world and a lot of food that's going to be grown in the, in the world is going to have a high water uh, cost 
Scotland will actually have more rain in the future and we're very good at growing food. And it's how do we then compete internationally with that uh, brand of a high, high quality environment with a sustainable food production system. And we need to think about how the combination of technology and natural assets actually fit together. Okay. And uh, Will, 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 Will Webster, gosh, okay, he's thank for me to say. Thank you. Um, so uh, I think the, the question about the sort of balance between private and public sector and competition or not is actually a really good one. Um, because if to deliver what, what the objectives are of the, uh, the Climate Change Bill and the CCC report, I mean, it needs a vast amount of investment. So you can do a kind of back of the envelope calculation and arrive at however many hundreds of billions it is. But, you know, what you really have to have is um, what we, if, if you're thinking about the kind of balance between incentives and regulation, then it's got to be on the side of incentives in that we have to deliver large amounts of investment. So there needs to be a positive framework for investment, whatever it is. And I think that's a bit the lesson from the um, renewables and particularly the offshore wind sector in that uh, a regulatory and commercial framework was developed over a number of years that was very supportive to that kind of investment. And, and, and as a result, the costs came down and they've come down rapidly. Um, so th that needs to be... Um, you know, rolled out into the other target areas such as uh, carbon capture and storage. Um, so, if just just turning to that, I think one of the one of the questions that has to be asked is not only about you know what is the the, the most advantageous technology, but that actually it depends on what you're using it for. So, you know, electrification will work well on some sectors such as you know small commercial vehicles. It's not going to work so good uh, yet on. Um, other areas where ever of energy use like heavy freight um, heating some some industrial users and cement so you know you need the full range of technologies to uh, achieve these reductions across the board which is the which is in, in you know the kind of news item of the CCC is that if you go to a net zero you know you can't have sectors that are outside that framework so um, the the so kind of the the answer to to this is really that you know, it's not just about, you know, the positive incentives are needed to deliver investment, but investors are also going to want to see a, a long-term framework for particular technologies that, that need to be applied in different circumstances. Um, so, you know, if you take CCS, um, you know, you might, there are projects around the globe. There's about 20 or so projects, but most of those have been done on quite an opportunistic basis in particular circumstances. If we want to develop that as, a, as, a, as an industry in its own right, <laughs> Uh, which it would would need to be, um, you know, there there are quite a few legislative gaps at the moment around, and those things need to be filled, and uh, you know, a framework of legislation needs to develop to really make that happen at scale, and it's when you have it, there's something happening at scale, that's when the cost reductions happen. So Do you think the message is getting across about fuel sovereignty being a big issue for like the UK? I mean, I don't know what the numbers are. I think that we produce about 60% and we import a bit, is yeah. it, or is that the other way around? Well, I, I think that comes to the point being made about, you know, making the most of our the industries we have and the position we find ourselves in. So, uh, yeah, but oil, oil and gas, I mean, it's still, you know, there's still a, a big consumer desire for gaseous fuels and fuels in liquid form. Um, and, you know, that will, you know, that will probably continue and, you know, change to some extent. Um, and that is a, that is a, um, uh, a fact that, that has to be dealt with during the transition. Um, so we have to give consumers what they want to some extent and what they're used to. Um, so, yeah, we, we import around, um, uh, our net imports of oil and gas are about 60 million tonnes of oil equivalent out of the total consumption of 150 million tonnes of oil equivalent. I mean, you know, we're, we're starting from the position where, you know, still 75% of the primary energy used in the UK and in Scotland too is from oil and gas. So, you know, we have to start from where we are. Um, we have to make it most of the advantages that we have that come from that heritage. And then that has to be part of, you know, how, in, how the UK and Scotland in particular develops its net zero pathway. And, and although it will have lessons for other countries around the world, you know, that they will have to follow their own pathway to some degree as well. Okay, Andrew Midgley. Thank you. It's just a, a quick uh, comment on innovation. So, with s specific reference to the agricultural industry, I would say that um, you know, the industry is innovative at the moment and, and adopts new technologies readily, and we're supported in that by the research institutes 
which we have a very strong base in, in Scotland. The, the, the thing that comes to my mind in, in your, your raising the question around the relative weight of sort of the private and, and the role of the state in, in driving innovation, whether it should be left to the market and so on, is that um, the innovation that uh, the industry adopts at the moment is, um, I, I suggest, you know, driven mainly by the market. It's by, you know, uh, servicing, you know, what the market uh, would like and, you know, efficiencies within the industry and so on. Uh, but when we're talking about reducing emissions, we're getting into the realms of innovation being required for the delivery of public goods, where the market has less of a driver unless you can find a sort of monetary mechanism to, you know, drive that private innovation. And, uh, and so I think as you get more into the realms of the delivery of public goods, then there is an increasing role of the state to sort of intervene in that delivery of the innovation. And then on top of that, uh, it's the extension, it's the work with the industry, it's the advice and support to enable the, the spread of that innovation. Um, thank you. Thank you, convener. And just in that regard, and again, declaring an interest, but in terms of the delivery of public goods, and I do want to ask other questions too, but in terms of restoration of um, peat bogs and um, uh, developing this idea earlier expressed of a, um, a land um, class, a new climate change mitigation land class, you say that the delivery of public goods is, is, is going to be hard and, and difficult to fund. Uh, either it will either end up by being by individuals or by government. And I'm wondering if, if there was a new land class that perhaps the private sector, um, perhaps uh, pension funds or others, uh, might buy into um, supporting and sustaining uh, some of the, the land that will bring such benefits in terms, ultimately, of carbon capture and storage. Um, and I just wondered uh, if you thought that might be a reasonable idea, a question to you and maybe Colin Campbell in, in that regard, but please say exactly what you think. Okay. So the idea that um, there, that you can deliver public goods through private investment is um, highly attractive because essentially, if you're if you're a land manager, if you're a farmer or a crofter, and you're running a business, at the moment, what you're doing is generating income from selling what you have grown or reared, and um, you're not necessarily generating income from the other things that you are delivering to society. So if you can find a way of putting a value on those other things so that you can then um, you know, receive an income because you're delivering something that does have value to other people, um, that's, that's been something that's been sought for uh, a long time. So ideas along the lines of what you're talking about have been floated um, before. Um, so the, th the sorts of things I have in mind um, are things to do with the Wooden Carbon Code, and the peatland code was specifically designed in order to try and create a mechanism that gave private investors in a corporate social responsibility market, if you like, confidence that if they were investing in a particular type of land management, that they were going to get a very clear and rigorously defined carbon outcome. And um, the question, it's great, to, it's great to have the ideas, I'd, I'd probably need to look at the detail. The question that, that your idea raises straight away is whether or not just having a land class would underpin that private investment sufficiently enough. Normally, if you're delivering a certain sort of uh, outcome, then the Woodland Carbon Code, for, for example, is much more sophisticated in the sense that it would, it would say, if you're doing this activity, then you're getting this carbon outcome and it's different for woodland than it would be for peatland. It might be different for biodiversity and climate and so on. So the sophistication that might be required, it might need to be disaggregated. Indeed, and develop a hierarchy, perhaps. Yeah. Oh, yes. <coughs> I think it's actually um, quite feasible to have a, a sort of land capability for carbon sequestration map of, the, of Scotland. I mean, that's, uh, we have land capability for agriculture and every farmer in the country is fully aware of that because their union dues are based on whether on class one land which is the highest quality or class seven land and um, so they're very familiar with that we also have a land capability for forestry so getting a national map which would indicate the areas where you're most likely to be able to sequester carbon is entirely possible we also have now quite sophisticated models which can predict how much carbon sequestration you would get by planting trees for example in certain areas 
uh, that's very different from saying that we're going to have 10,000 hectares of trees. It's actually saying we're going to have X quantity of carbon. Uh, so I think all these things are possible. And these are then provide instruments for people to use to try, maybe perhaps to trade in carbon. But the whole area of carbon offsetting in farming is, is quite controversial and uh, in terms of the framing of it and how you actually implement it. But the message I quite often get from farmers is they would like to see that. They would like to see sort of uh, getting credit for good carbon management on their farm and seeing a carbon level inventory, not a national inventory, which is um, separated in different ways. Uh, and they get quite frustrated, in fact, that they feel they're doing all the right things, but they're not getting all the credit for doing all the right things. Um, and there are, there are pitfalls in all of that, but I think it's really worth exploring because we need to get everybody on board. And one way of getting on, people on board is to show them an incentive in doing so. Um, so I think there's a lot more to be done in that area, but in terms of providing the scientific evidence and data, Scotland's very well placed. We've got very good national uh, land and soils data sets that can actually be used to try and develop the mechanisms for that type of approach. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I wanted to ask also about carbon capture and storage, and because the, 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 the sort of what I'm hearing around the room is a kind of degree of scepticism about this as being something. Uh, we're going to have a limited amount of money to invest as a, as a country, as, as government, and, and yet that will require a significant amount of investment. And should we be focusing on other things? And since your scepticism, since you're the experts on this, it, it won't be without justification. I just would like to kind of bottom that out where you see that. Perhaps, um, Mr. McCrone. Yes, thank you. So, um, yes, I was being a bit sceptical about it. I think um, you wouldn't want to be out on a limb in terms of pushing um, CCS technologies um, that were different from uh, what was being um, put forward elsewhere where in the world. So I think there's a sort of element of all the countries have to sort of move together, uh, maybe some a little bit ahead but some a little bit behind. But um, the, the technologies where we are absolutely clear that these are going to be cost effective through the 2020s and beyond and probably more than cost effective there's a lot that we can do there. So things like making sure that the um, electric vehicle charging points are rolled out, that dynamic charging becomes possible so people can charge their car when electricity price is low and, uh, if necessary, discharge the grid when the electricity price is high. Um, now that um, subsidies have been removed for um, onshore wind and um, solar, then uh, making it as easy as possible for companies and, and utilities to sign uh, power purchase agreements with new projects so that those can move ahead on the basis of a fixed um, electricity tariff. Um, and then things like, um, you know, what does Scotland do with its nuclear sites when they come up um, to the end of their lives? There's a number of options which could be um, cost effective there perhaps. So um, th these are sort of practical issues for the 2020s. At the moment, I don't see I don't. I, I think what the answer is on a decarbonising heat, for instance, isn't entirely clear. There are a number of runners and riders, and we're doing a lot of research on that at the moment. It's a little bit the same with CCS. We don't really know what the cost effectiveness of it will be, or what the future carbon price may be, and whether that might be enough to get some of it going or not. Um, so I put the emphasis a bit on what we know is going to be cost effective in the 2020s, trying to maximise that. Will Webster? I, 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 you know, I, I think we'd, we'd probably take a different slant on it. I wouldn't say that you know, we, would, we would disagree necessarily, but um, I think the, the, the thing that the CCC report brings is the need to go to, to the big things that you can change more and to go to those quickly. Um, uh, and that's the difference in going from an 80% <coughs> target to a net zero target. So you know, I, I would say that... Um, the emphasis now actually has to be on moving all of the potential solutions ahead and then seeing how you know, they can apply in different circumstances in diff for different uses of energy. So I think we would, we would see that you know, one of the messages and from the CCC report, I think it was quite unequivocal on this, is you know, carbon capture and storage is not an option, it's an essential. Um, we still would see it as one that has strong potential in you know, a lot of areas, you know, the first of which being probably industrial uses of heat and use, use in industrial sectors. But it probably could, you know, we think it probably has applications in, you know, several other energy uses as well. And we won't find that out 
until we develop a program on that and until that program is developed at scale. So, um, and I, I also would, uh, I also would um, caution against the idea that there's a fixed pot of money. If we have the mentality that there's only so much to go around, then we are not going to achieve net zero. So the, and the CCC report was pretty unequivocal about that and pretty frank about the costs involved. So one to two percent of GDP, whatever, you know, whether, whether that's Scotland's GDP or the rest of the UK, you know, this is, these are not small sums. And that, that's got to be recognised as part of this process. I'm going to bring in Stuart Stevenson because I'm, I'm guessing that Stuart has a particular constituency issue around CCS. Um, well, yes, I, I wanted to come back right to the very first uh, remarks uh, uh, that uh, Angus McCrow made and to just try and tease out his antipathy to CCS because clearly I know of six technologies, which means there's at least 50. Um, but in particular, the differentiation between pre-combustion and post-combustion. In other words, retrofitting old kit with post-combustion, which is clearly quite expensive and with a limited period in which you get your capital back, and pre-combustion, pre where you're essentially going to be focusing on building totally new facilities, where the efficiencies and everything are in control. And furthermore, post-combustion, you've got Taylor. It's a one-off build each time. Were your comments addressed at both those? Uh, because it does strike me that the pre-combustion, new build approach leads to the prospect of economies of scale and redeployment of technologies. And I do know, I do know that uh, it was said there are 20 CCS projects. I know of 18 in China alone, although only two of them are big and 16 of them are kind of trial little ones. So were you making that differentiation or were you just being broad brush? Um, well, uh, don't the, touch. The, the, don't touch. No, OK. Um, so there isn't any antipathy, is the first thing. Um, it's just uh, an observation in, in terms of what I see. You know, our clients are the sort of biggest players in energy worldwide from, you know, the, the sort of traditional side and um, the, the new side, if you like. And um, CCS, there are, as you say, there are pilot projects going on. There's quite a, a few things happening in China. Um, some interesting things happening on industrial CCS. But in terms of the technologies actually moving forward and becoming closer to being rolled out on a sort of wide scale anywhere, I don't really think we're any fur further forward than we were 10 years ago. Maybe that'll change in the 2020s. I don't know. Funding was withdrawn from the carbon capture and storage, you know, from the UK government took that funding away. So, for example, in Stuart's constituency, that's Peter Head was, was involved in that programme. So... You know, I can't remember how, how long ago that was. Four, five it's happened years? Twice. Five it's happened years. Twice. So, you yes. know, I guess that if there's that consistency of funding, mm -hmm. that what you've said is there's not much movement in 10 years, that might not have been the case. Maybe there needs to be the consistency in funding, and then we might be able to yes. address that. So, I think policy is obviously part of the answer. And in the UK, there were setbacks with the, the programme being taken away. Um, there's also around the world that have been some um, CCS projects that haven't gone well and have gone way over budget and have rather sort of burnt. Do a few forgive fingers. me. Are you making? I, I just want to get back to mm -hmm. the core of the question I'm yeah. trying to get the answer to. Are you seeing a difference in your economic analysis because that's what your mm -hmm. skill is between the pre the retrofitting CCS and new build or? or not, or is there simply not enough information and analysis to give a meaningful answer? Well, I think CCS becomes a serious option if we get a carbon price that's high enough, particularly yeah, one right. on a sort of wide scale internationally. So right. um, the, the sort of signs of that happening are not good, to be honest. I mean, okay, the, the EU ETS carbon price is higher than it was, but it's still significantly below where it would need to be to make CCS a, a practical proposition, whether it's pre-combustion or post-combustion. So, um, you know, unless that changes, um, 
you know, we, we see the, the sort of advance of the, of the technologies that are showing rapid reductions in, in cost and continue to do so as something that's going to be much more a feature of the 2020s than CCS probably. Unless we get such a climate emergency that, um, you know, governments completely change their policies and choose very high carbon prices and all the rest of it. I mean, that leads us on to talk, really talking about the, the business positives that are out there, the, the wins that there is for the Scottish economy. And in all the sectors that you're all representing, there are opportunities there. I don't know whether we want to open that up, because um, it seems to me that we talk an awful lot about challenges, but, you know, we don't really have the... Of course, it's a challenge, but there's also opportunity there as well. Necessity is indeed the mother of invention. Um, so does anyone want to talk about what you think might be the opportunities for, for your area? And actually for Scotland maybe to be, we've already talked about what we've got in a natural environment, but yes. Um, yes, yeah, so building on what I'd, I'd said earlier on the survey of the suppliers, the, um, another result from it was that they, they all were already planning for growth, or at least they had a, a plan in the drawer that they could pull out once the, the buttons pressed on setting clear targets and policies. Um, and so that's across the board. That's heating, um, heating installers, it's um, energy efficiency, insulation, delivery agents. They're ready to go, and they're projecting sig significant, you know, huge growth and export potential for, for their businesses, which is very positive. Um, some of the challenges which can be turned into positives is there are still some gaps in certain geographies in Scotland where skills need to be developed. There's a need for further apprenticeships. There's a need to bring more young people into the industry. Um, and, and so there's, there's an opportunity there for growth that could be supported through, um, through apprenticeships, through training, through skills development colleges and such. And, and so that could be, again, accelerated. Um, but the, the good news is, is that they, they know the, the market is already growing because customers are telling them, you know, now customers are coming to them saying, I want a heat pump, instead of saying, I want heat and give me a boiler. People know that they've seen one, they have friends that have one, that like them, they, you know, so the, so the market is shifting and also attitudes are shifting. You know, people are now, um, there's a... A recent survey that came um, that is due to be published soon from Citizens Advice Scotland um, that is showing that people are more in favour of standards being uh, energy performance standards being regulated for housing, and you know some 62% were in favour, um, and their main reason was for the environment, and so again that that shows a shift in attitudes because further you know other research that they've done. In, um, a couple of years ago was a bit more cautious. So I think, you know, we have an opportunity here to not only win the jobs, but, you know, move with this um, growing interest and concern um, that we have and turn it into those opportunities for emissions reductions and jobs and all those other benefits. <clears throat> Perhaps following up on the point about uh, carbon capture and storage, we're working around understanding some of those economic arguments and some of the economic challenges that will be faced, recognising that this is clearly a key component of our meeting these uh, new and critical targets. So we're working with both the production or customer end, if you will, whichever way you want to describe it, the industrial biotechnology that needs to go to the communities, the energy intensive companies uh, in Grangemouth, for example, or in Teesside in the north of England and the identified clusters. Um, and also with the likes of the oil and gas industry and the oil and gas authority as part of the decommissioning of offshore infrastructure, whether there's a repurposing of offshore infrastructure um, that could be done and the project at St Fergus is a good example. There is no question with the industry leadership that we were discussing <laughs> with that the withdrawal of funding previously has induced a certain amount of scepticism about the commitment to doing this. But there is also a recognition that as major corporate global companies, they're going to have to address this challenge. So if we have the potential for infrastructure here, then we can do that work. So there are pilot projects underway. It's UK as well as Scottish government level and European level as well. We've engaged with other countries on the other side of the North Sea and around the North Sea as well to understand the projects they're working on to try and bring all of that together because we're going to have to address it at that sort of scale. So 
There are big opportunities, there are undoubtedly big challenges, and the economics of it will need a lot of work, as will the incentivising then of how are you going to make companies, reckon, uh, producers recognise that this, this is a key part of decarbonising their process. It all needs to join up. At the moment, there are a number of different pieces of the picture being assembled and, and, and looked at, um, but it is to do in part that economic analysis as well, because we do recognise that it's, it's going to have to be proven how it will work and will need public as well as private uh, engagement and incentivisation to make it work. But there is big opportunity in Scotland just now. There's a big opportunity within the North Sea Basin. There are also big opportunities because we have some very major energy intensive companies who are important to the economy of the country. And as part of the work that we're doing with the oil and gas sector, not just the, um, uh, taking, the decommissioning of, techn of, of, of technology, but also the diversification of the, in the industry base. There is some exceptional technology in, the, in there already, which can be applied across a range of other areas of technology uh, and other sectors. But part of it will be uh, addressing the opportunity and challenge around how do we move to carbon capture use as well. And that's a separate element to a certain extent with the industrial biotechnology piece, but also the storage aspect of it as well. Mike Watson. In terms of the positives, we see huge positives in pursuing the net zero goal. So at the moment, the renewable electricity sector already employs 16,000 people in Scotland and generates 5.5 billion in revenue. As we increase the amount of renewable electricity we are generating in this country, we see that job number and that revenue going up. And it's very important to bear in mind that a lot of those jobs are in remote and rural areas where they provide high quality long term employment in areas where there are a few other opportunities. Picking up on Elizabeth's point, we're very keen to see young people coming into our industry and we will actually be holding our Young People's Green Energy Awards on Thursday night to celebrate the level of skill and expertise which is entering our industry from extremely passionate young people. So we see a very positive future. We also have found in a recent survey that uh, our members are already exporting expertise and knowledge to 73 different countries around the world. So when we say we're looking at a target of making Scotland a world leader in renewable energy, it's not just about meeting our own energy needs, it's also about Scotland becoming this beacon in the world of expertise and knowledge and making us the country that you come to if you want to do a renewable energies revolution of your own. John wants to come in briefly. Can I just ask you about the manufacturing opportunities because thus far they seem to have passed us by and we would like to capture some of those as well. This is something that we're extremely keen on and our members already met. Um, if you bear with me, I will just check the dates for you. Um, I have too many pieces of paper in front of me. I've already met to talk about how we make the most of the industrial opportunities that we have with work that we've done with our members looking into the lifetime, um, inc um, the lifetime of income generation over uh, onshore and offshore wind, what we're finding is there's between 50 and 65% domestic content. So that's jobs and work that are going to domestic companies. We do find that um, when it comes to the big infrastructure projects, Scotland is not competing on the world scale like we would like to see it do. Um, this is a lot to do with a long-term underinvestment in infrastructure that's been UK-wide. And as we say, our members are working very hard to see how we could change that because we don't just want to compete on the knowledge and expertise side. We would like to see Scotland competing across the board on a global scale. And while, and while we might be playing catch-up in that regard, is there still an opportunity, in your view, for Scotland to do so? We work on climate change. We're always optimists on these things. So, yes, there are opportunities with appropriate investment. It could be done, but the key will be the appropriate investment and how the money is found to do that. Thank you. Uh, Mark Ruskell wanted to come in, I think, on that. Yeah, I think that just theme. reading the Scottish Renewable Submission, um, you, you suggested a clean power plan. And I was just wondering if, if that was something which you know, other, other stakeholders around the table were, were backing and how that might differ from what we have at the moment which is obviously a mixture of devolved and reserve responsibilities and an energy strategy for Scotland. Mm -hmm. What is, a, is the idea of a clean power plan something which kind of, you know, builds on that, develops it, and in which case, you know, where, where should we be going next? Yeah. 
So what we're calling for with the clean energy plan is we need to look very carefully at the science of what's come out of the CCC report about how many gigawatts literally of electricity we need to be generating and what the um, technology mix across that might be, how much do we expect to generate onshore, how much offshore. And then working back from that, we need to look both at our policies and our planning. So if we know how much energy we need to generate onshore, how much of that can we generate from repowering our existing wind farms? How many more uh, new wind farms or other technologies would we need to roll out onshore to meet that target? How many shallow bottom and other sites will we need offshore to be able to meet that? So instead of um, doing what we have done at the moment, which is where can we find a site and how much electricity can we generate out of it, we look at how much electricity do we need and then how do we meet that target? Right. And is that different to what we have within, within the energy strategy at the moment? It's more of an approach rather than a. An it's more of a refinement, kind of and now we're looking at a new uh, climate change target and a new goal and a climate emergency. We need to revisit that just to make sure that we are actually going to be able to hit right. the targets okay. that we are setting for yeah. ourselves. And the market has to change, doesn't it, really? Because of the, the cost of electricity versus something like if you're looking at heating your home. Yeah. You, your, your consumer is not going to go with electricity over gas to heat their home at the moment. But of course, we've also got the, the targets about electrification of, of vehicles as well. And, and, and mm -hmm. that's going to be a huge demand is going to be there for, for electricity. How can we make it that it's like cost effective, that electricity is not seen as the most expensive option uh, for, for everything? This is going to be a key challenge in the just transition, and we don't hide from that fact. Um, as um, we've already said, we've heard that the cost of electric vehicles is likely to come down to make them more attractive. There's also other advantages to having electric vehicles in that they're battery storage. One of the key problems that we have on our transition to a renewable energy system is storing renewable energy can be a challenge, unlike coal, gas, oil, which can be stored in their native form before converting into electricity. So we see that grid services are probably going to come into the mix as well as to how this works, and smart technology will be very important about people being able to draw electricity when it's at its cheapest and put it back into the grid when it's at, um, they can make the most out of it. So these will be key parts of the transition. Okay. Um, Claudia, you had a question. Thanks, Kavina. In fact, uh, that leads seamlessly on to my question for all the panel members about <coughs> how they see with the 1.5, which is what we're focusing on today, obviously, um, uh, that um, someone wants to intervene, never mind, um, that, that um, it's very important that we, we hear from everybody um, on this committee about... Um, workers and businesses and communities, um, everyone will be affected by, um, by moving to net zero by uh, 2045. And so I'd, I'd value comments from people. And, and uh, I mean, for instance, um, Will Webster, you've already highlighted the positive impact the sector can have um, to supporting the, um, the transition. And I'm, I very much hope and expect that that, that from the perspective of your sector will be uh, a just transition as well. So it would be helpful to hear from everybody uh, who hasn't yet made that contribution, what that will be. Okay. We well, well just, yeah, I mean, just, just to elaborate on that point and a bit the previous discussion, because, I, you know, I, I, I think you're right to say um, that from the question, it's, you know, you've got to focus on the opportunity that comes from this activity. You know, the, the flip side of the cost is the opportunity and investment it will bring. So. Um, you know, clearly, um, you know, what, whatever, the, what, whatever the amounts involved, there's going to be a significant amount of that that will go to, you know, offshore investment probably. You know, whether that's offshore wind, CCS, um, or other technologies, and you know, that that obviously is a, a real advantage of the Scottish economy to have that expertise um, from a range of sectors. Um, and there are certainly some transferable skills that go from across different sectors. Whether you're thinking in terms of uh, project management, whether you're thinking in terms of safety, um, all of those are core cool competences, you know, certainly of our sector and others too, um, and developing that uh, as a result of this additional investment has got to be beneficial. Um, you know, and we're seeing that already, in our, particularly in our supply chain, um, having clients you know, both in the oil and gas sector and in the renewable sector. Um, and also, to a certain extent, um, companies investing across the different sectors, so the floating 
the floating offshore wind farm was actually developed by Equinor, which is one of our members, uh, using their, you know, their, their offshore expertise. So, you know, I, I think there is, a, there is definitely a certain um, synergy and a locational um, benefit um, across, you know, up and down the North Sea that will, will result from the, uh, the, the transition. And that, you know, has a, has a regional locational element to it, which is, which is you know, advantageous, you know, across the board. And, it, and it, you know, different poles of development to the ones that... Uh, um, you, know, t you, you typically get. So I think there, there, is, there, is, there are definitely some uh, regional development benefits to come out of the uh, uh, transition process. Can I just ask you uh, have, have, uh, is, it, is it possible for you to tell the committee if, if your members, in view of 1.5, have shifted um, views in terms of where finance should be going, in terms of fossil fuel and, and the transition itself? Yeah, I mean, I think that's possibly something I can get back to you on that in that you know we have a lot of members and they have different strategies yeah. and so on but you know you, you will have seen in the in the in the press that you know, uh, you know certain companies adopting resolutions from their shareholders mm -hmm. who have an important voice and that's a good reason not to divest from uh, energy companies by the way um, that you know, this is um, you know I, this is an area where you know companies are certainly thinking very carefully in response to how they develop their overall strategies and you know they 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 take this very seriously well that'd be valuable if you can get back to us then thank you um, so at uh, nfu scotland we view the concept of just transition as um, extremely important and uh, partly that's because of the some of the things that are proposed uh, in terms of the potential impact on the industry so if we look at what the Committee on Climate Change um, proposed in, for agriculture, we kind of see it in broad, three broad uh, sort of bits, if you like. So there's the industry has to adopt all the mitigation measures to reduce emissions that you know, is possible. But then there's also recommendations around dietary change. So that that's a, re a reduction in the consumption of uh, beef, lamb and dairy by 20%. That's a conservative estimate. The sum will go much further. Um, and, and, the, and the thinking is that the... Um, the, the, that reduction in consumption will mean that there is a kind of an intensification with a shift towards uh, pigs and poultry, uh, and that frees up land for land use change. So you'd have a 20% shift from agricultural land into another use. Now, that, that change, the dietary change uh, in particular, potentially brings uh, quite big challenge to the industry. Now, if you're talking, uh, the, 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 if you think about what the contribution is to the agricultural output at the moment from beef sheep and milk, you get to about 45% of agricultural output. So if you take a 20% reduction, it, ha it starts to have a big impact. Um, now, some people say, well, you know, there's accommodation there. But I mean, we, I think we look at it from the perspective of our members. And when you think about it from the perspective of individual businesses, you've got lots of agricultural businesses that, um, you know, are not huge. They're all sort of... A, very pre a predominance of SMEs, and um, there's a fairly high degree of um, sort of reliance on ongoing farm support. So if you start changing the income, then you start to put these businesses under greater and greater pressure, and and you start to start you, sorry you start to get to a situation where you could think it, it wouldn't be beyond the realms of possibility where quite a lot of businesses would go out of business, and that's people losing their livelihood, essentially losing their jobs. Now, some of the scenarios for dietary change um, are talking about 50% reduction in consumption of beef, lamb, and dairy. Now, if you think about what that would mean in terms of those sectors, and you, we, at the moment, there's 67,000 people employed in agriculture. If you're going to reduce the, the consumption of particular products that are the mainstay of Scottish agriculture, that's a, that's a lot of people's jobs potentially at risk. So there are issues around dietary change, and clearly we're not in the realms of determining that people have to do one thing or another, and the industry has to adapt. And, it ha and, and there's opportunities here, that, it, according to the previous question, there are opportunities around focusing on supporting Scottish farmers, on, on focusing on quality, um, and a great deal of care is required, but this is where just transition comes in, because ultimately the changes that we're potentially looking at mean that people's livelihoods and jobs are at risk. So can you just tell us consequences as well, potentially, of having to import more food, which is going to have an impact on our, uh, you know,
carbon footprint as a country as well, as well if we're not producing food locally and there's still a demand for like certain proteins, for example. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. We don't want to get in a situation where we sort of move down a direction of travel w which uh, has an impact on the industry in terms of reducing production if at the same time there is a demand and we're just importing uh, products from elsewhere because all we're doing there is exporting our emissions. Mm. So what would you like to see in relation to um, uh, land use and particularly agriculture in terms of the support through a Just Transition or a Just Transition Commission um, for people who um, contribute to, yeah. to yeah. things the way, as, as a policy change, yeah. um, what would you like to see happen? I, th I think at the moment where we are is actually we, we don't have a very sophisticated understanding of the potential way that things could play out. There's, there's quite a blunt narrative and, and this is uh, developed in the last few years at an international level, which is focused on livestock uh, are bad for the climate. If, if you eat less meat, then you're you know, making a contribution. <coughs> and, and that's a very generalised uh, sort of approach and understanding. And it, it seems to just keep being perpetuated. And, and I think what we would like to see is much greater uh, sophistication of analysis of well if you were to do this then you know what are the options for change because in Scotland many people on the ground have no other option because the, 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 the land is not capable of doing many other things agriculturally so um, you know and then how would that play out and that would then enable us to get into a position of knowing um, you know what we would need to do to support the industry and at the moment I don't think we are in that place Colin Campbell. Ben, I mean, I think there is a great need for a just transition in relation to the land use change. Um, we clearly need land use change to actually be the, have the transformative shift that we require to meet the climate change targets. Um, but land is something that takes a long time to um, develop to its full productivity and to maintain it that way. Uh, livestock's clearly under a lot of pressure, particularly from trees. But actually, there's transition land uses that we could look at. So look at agroforestry, where you have space trees, sheep can graze in between. There's actually benefit to the sheep in terms of the energetics, because they have shelter in the sp uh, spring and the, the autumn time. That, the, the energetic balance, better energetic balance, obviously reduces greenhouse gas emissions. But the, the big issue is about how do farmers trans transition to being foresters? If you go to other countries, such as Sweden, the farmers there are farmers during the spring, the summer and the autumn, and they're foresters in the winter time. But we train people to be farmers or we train people to be foresters. We don't train people to be land use managers. And there's a lot of transition we need to do around the culture and in terms of the methods and skills and knowledge that people need to have transition type land uses in the future. I think the, the losses of jobs in agriculture are also quite serious for managing our landscapes. Farmers are not just farmers, they actually manage our landscapes and the ecosystem services that we get from our land. And we need to think very carefully about the consequences of any land abandonment, for example, that might, might occur. Um, so I think there's a huge topic in terms of the just transition for the agricultural sector in terms of land use. Okay. Jess Pepper. Yeah, I was going to connect back to the question about economy and jobs as well. Obviously, um, I outlined the opportunities that we have if we invest in them, um, in buses and trains and ferries. But um, I think we need to look at the whole system and this is across um, everything. So, for example, we need to maybe be thinking about in the economy how we work, where we work, um, and working to thinking about avoid, shift, and improve the forms of travel that we um, need. So, for example, in rail, we think about modal shift from car to bus and rail and active travel, but actually it may be from air to rail as well, and that might be a more efficient way of working. So thinking not just about the jobs within the sector, which are hugely important and there's an opportunity there, but about how the whole economy functions in terms of its efficiencies, its resilience. There's going to be issues in terms of infrastructure um, and our well-being as well. And this is where the transition needs to be just in terms of jobs, in terms of economy, but um, for everyone. We keep um, hearing the words enabling, and in the last session people were talking about people knowing what's right for their place. And sometimes we think just in big chunks. Actually, there's lots of little chunks and never has there been an appetite for mobilizing people to be engaged and to 
change their behaviour to make a difference than ever before. Um, so there's real opportunities in travel, for example, lots of the journeys that we make are very little journeys and actually we could all be making huge differences in them. We see that cutting um, across the sector and if we can enable people to make those changes and to be part of the solution as a nation, put it all on the table and figure out what we need to do collectively, then that is good for our public health as well. People in the previous session were talking about folk feeling overwhelmed and daunted by the, the challenge here. But actually what we know, and public health um, consultants will tell you, is that once people feel that there's something to buy into, that they can be part of the solution, then that's a really um, compelling vision to go for and something which can motivate and make people feel better, feel happier and healthier. The, whether it's um, those who are elderly or the children and the young people who are engaged in this debate, often they are at the margins of these services. You know, investing in our bus system would hugely help the 14-year-old who might like to go from a rural community to another part of the community to do a Saturday job, but she can't because there's no bus that runs that day. Or the elderly folk who depend upon that connectivity to get out and about and be functioning, that will invest in the local economy, but it will also have wide-reaching benefits. We know that communities that are better connected, people feel that there's less need, they can be at their home longer, so there's a um, reduction in the costs on health and social care, for example. So there's a resilience there which we can be building within our community. And for me, and Transform was recognising that there's where we miss things like active travel and these opportunities for that kind of compelling vision, the UK advice was more about the big chunks and um, carbon captures and storage rather than all the little chunks which are going to make such a huge well, difference. Well, you raise a really important issue, which I guess leads into quite a lot of sectors, is that there's small, easy wins based on a change in perception. One, one thing you've mentioned is pe people actually want to do things, but there's little things standing in their way. So you talk about, I, I guess, something like active travel, safe, safety is an issue. Yeah. I, I want to um, maybe bring in Margaret Simpson because um, I'm aware of the fact that Freight isn't just on roads, it's on rail as well. Is there not an easy win there in that rail freight is underused? Uh, to be blunt, no. Um, right, okay. Because 90% of freight is gone by road, is, is road travel. You're not going to change that at all. At its best, you'll get about 5% of the trucks off the road onto rail. Mm -hmm. The reason being, rail is suitable for things like whiskey, if you get the gauge right, which isn't the case across all of Scotland's network, uh, timber, things like that. So it's bulk goods. Um, the other thing to, to, to think about is, to maybe, maybe I'll give you some figures to help sort of build the picture. So the FT um, estimates that if you look at a town with a population of about 100,000 people in it, you're moving an average of 4,500 tons of good every day. You break that down, that's 187 tons are being picked up every hour or dropped off within the city. So if you take Glasgow or Edinburgh, take Edinburgh first, we're looking at around about 21,600 tons a day, which is 900 tons an hour. So if you look at the, the broad spectrum, it's important to point out that's got nothing to do with vans. This is all the trucks, so the heavier end. So if you average that out at, say, 10 tonnes as a payload, um, to give you an example, a 24-tonne truck only has a 10-tonne payload. It can't carry 24 tonnes. So that's an average of 90 HGVs are in the city every hour. And it's nothing to do with parcel delivery. It's everything else. Parcel delivery is a really, really small element of it. And I think that's where people think freight's just parcels being delivered from Amazon. That's not what it is. It's everything else. It's the bricks, it's the wood, it's the coffee, it's the milk, it's the clothes, it's the... It's absolutely everything. Um, so I think thinking about that amount of freight going into simply the city of Edinburgh, you're not going to shift that all into a train. That's not... If it, the way to think about it is the city is a, uh, is a, a consumer. So the city has all sorts of different demands for all sorts of different products to be brought into the city at different times of the day. It massively changes when things like the festival happen. The uplift is huge because of the number of extra people that are in the city. Um, and it's about absolutely, where it's possible, put some freight on trains. And it, we would absolutely support that. And we have members that are actively looking at that. Um, there are some constraints um, with regards weight because once it gets to its destination, it inevitably has to go by road to the final mile we talk about. And it's about making it easy for that container to come off the back of a train onto the back of a truck and move that to its final destination. 
which ultimately would be a distribution centre. Um, so absolutely there's an element that can be done, but I think we need to be very cautious about the fact that our road infrastructure is vital to our economy and the way we move goods around this country is by road. Yeah. Um, so there's limited, definitely, opportunities, but it's about making that infrastructure as, as reliable as, as possible and putting the best, cleanest vehicles on it. Is there any maritime opportunities? I mean, much of the food and, and other products arrive by containers. There are, and that is being explored. Um, that we had a consultation with a company recently who are looking at reopening the Rosyth to Holland route. Um, the really key thing for me when I heard that presentation was it's got ten times the capacity. The reason the Rosyth Zeebrugge didn't work was because it didn't, we couldn't get enough trucks on it. I think it could only take seven or eight trucks at a time. You're now looking at up to 100 trucks could go on that one crossing. So if it's not a time-sensitive product, absolutely no problem at all. Um, something like fishing, which would be up in Mr Stevenson's um, uh, constituency, is all about just in time. It's got to get there quickly, so there's no other option. You've got to take it by road south as quickly as you possibly can and sell it up to its marketplace. Putting that on a ship won't work. Putting whiskey on a ship, getting it across to America or wherever, absolutely works. Yes. I'd ask you, uh, from the perspective of your uh, organisation, whether um, you're looking at the model that has been raised in this committee previously um, about consolidation hubs outside um, cities and then um, smaller, uh, possibly electric vehicles going into the cities themselves, which has been funded um, by EU money, which I hardly dare mention today, but, uh, but, um, but has. Have you got comments on that? I, I think an urban consolidation centre will work in some scenarios. Um, but I think it's very, you need to be quite clear about what it is that an urban consolidation centre is. Freight and logistics, by its very definition, is all about efficiency, and the, the freight is already consolidated onto the back of the biggest truck so that it can make one journey to do all the deliveries. So if you add that additional link into the supply chain, there's ultimately additional costs. Um, I absolutely foresee no problem with, I'm trying to think of an example, Parcels to a point would probably work in urban consolidation and absolutely put them on the back of an electric van. But be aware that, as I said earlier, a 24-tonne truck can carry 10 tonnes. If you replace that with vans, you need 10 vans to then go into the city. And the biggest climate problem is congestion as far as transport is concerned. The stop-start nature and the what you want is a, a vehicle to be able to run at a set pace, slow and steady, through the city, get to its point, drop off and move on. Yeah, cool. That's not the same argument, is it? It's not, but I think there are other emissions apart from just tailpipe. Off the tires, tailpipe. Off the, yes, OK. There's we, the tires and brakes have and that things discussion like that. At a, at a later date. Come in on that. Well, I, I just wondered, since we're talking about transport, that, that I wonder to what extent uh, we can get a benefit by extending the life of our equipment, because there's a big embedded carbon cost in building a lorry, building a truck, and so on and so forth. I, I just think of my personal experience where I now run an eight-year-old car, which in its life has never broken down. My depreciation is a... Th you realise. Sorry? You've just jinxed that, you realise. Well, no, 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 no. It, it, depreciation is £1,000 a year. In 2005, my depreciation was 5000 a year. And, but more to the point, that tells you something about the carbon footprint and using things. And I just wonder... It is directed at the FTA, but it's actually a much more general question about using things for longer to make the embedded carbon uh, be distributed over more effort uh, and more benefit. Um, the members of the FTA will have different uses for different types of vehicles, and it will very much depend on the mileage that the vehicle is doing and what terrain it is doing it on. If it's doing milk runs, what we call milk runs, so short, regular journeys, absolutely you'll get a longer life out of the vehicle. Um, the industry as a whole is moving very much towards Euro 6. We estimate by 2020 about 50% of vehicles will be on Euro 6, which is the cleanest option there is for diesel. Um, absolutely, we're now looking at, the, the industry are looking at alternative fuel options, but there is no one standout option for that yet. So absolutely, I would agree with Mr Stevenson that once we understand what that option is and understand the life 
span of a vehicle, because obviously with all, uh, all organisations that run heavy goods, procurement and life of vehicle is very, very important, and ultimately what they will get when they sell that vehicle on. And I think it's important to realise that unless you, if you now have a Euro 5 vehicle, you're going to get a lot less money for that because nobody's going to want to buy it from you. Um, so it's all about Euro 6. Jess Pepper, and then I'll come to Mark, uh, Elizabeth Lane. Yeah, I was just going to quickly say, I think this is one area, for example, where there's a huge win to make, but we need to look creatively at what all the options are. There's not going to be one size that fits everything, so we need to look creatively at it. And also we can look to elsewhere. So in the Netherlands, for example, they're putting together, I think in statute right now, um, a zero emissions network for freight and looking at what the potential is there. So we can provide more information on that if that's of interest to the committee. Yeah, um, and Elizabeth Layton. Uh, yes, and the, the question about using things longer, there's an interesting example being done in Renfrewshire Council where they are combining budgets of, say, the retrofit, build and maintenance and repair, and they're looking at their housing stock and actually finding that it will be more cost effective to do a deep retrofit, so bringing these buildings as far up to net zero as they can now, and rather than tearing them down, looking for a new land, planning permission, you know, all of that entails, let alone the embodied carbon emissions that's lost. And, and that's the route they're going to take because they've decided that that is actually cost effective over, over the longer term. And so, so that's an example of how, how you can take that approach, you know, by, by using a deep, deep retrofit. And if I can segue on to the quick wins, um, I think, you know, this is so important in terms of this, this state, you know, we are in a state of climate emergency and you can use the quick wins to give, give comfort, give signals to say, yes, we are, you know, we're, we're on this. There are some no-brainers that we can get on with, but at the same time, you know, we're, we're all going to work together on longer-term plans, longer-term strategy. And there, I'm sure all of us could come up with, you know, a little top three of quick wins that could be done today, put in place today and send those signals, like, you know, with housing, new build regulations. They're already saying, Philip Hammond is already saying that for the rest of the UK. Are we going to be left behind? You know, why should we be connecting new homes to the gas grid? And, and you know, that's just one example. We, why are we funding replacement oil and LPG boilers? for the fuel poor. We should be putting them on to renewable heat and accepting that there's going to be an additional, there will be an additional cost yes. involved. And mm -hmm. repeat what I've said before. When your engineer, nearest engineer, is more than two hours travel away, there's a huge disincentive to change your technology because we were going to do it until we discovered that. Mm. So there may be examples, but I do think That's our true. government programs government money should be investing in low-carbon technologies and not perpetuating technologies that we know are yesterdays. And so, so there are those examples, some, some quick wins, and a quick win for yourselves, I believe, would be, as, as we have proposed, a target, putting in place a target in this bill of an EPCC ban C by 2030 for the vast majority of homes. So, you know, if we're in an emergency, we should be, it should look like not that we're all running around panicked, but it should look like there is considered action being taken to you know, reverse or repurpose policies. We should be using discretionary funds to implement projects that we know need to go ahead or research. You know, it should look like a full mobilization effort. Um, yes, you know, the, the climate change plan will be revised, um, but you know, that's, that's not enough in my view. You know, we should really be um, treating this as an emergency and giving people that comfort and those signals to show, you know, this is now the direction of travel and it will be accelerating. So get on board. Mark Ruskell. Um, yeah, I think leading on from that, I'd, I'd appreciate quick views around the table about the kind of infrastructure that we need uh, to deliver a low carbon economy. Um, in particular, I go back to the, the previous panel where we talked about locking in um, high carbon emissions, perhaps through the wrong type of infrastructure that's being invested in. Um, so I think, you know, we've heard an example perhaps there of, you know, private infrastructure, public infrastructure and housing, but that's a kind of national 
adds up to a national infrastructure in a way. But are there other examples of where we, we, we should be investing differently? Or maybe we've got the balance right at the moment, I don't know. Anybody? Yes, I'm going to watch them. So in terms of key infrastructure that will really make a difference, uh, Elizabeth's already touched on it, that heat networks, they are exceptionally common on, uh, in Europe, particularly in places like Denmark. We need to be putting in place the pa planning policies now. We acknowledge that the new heat networks that go in will probably not be powered by renewable energy. They probably will be gas powered. But once the network is in, retrospectively going back and changing the fuel source to a renewable um, source is much easier. If we wait until we've got the renewable source before we put in the heat networks, it will be too late. The other really important piece of infrastructure that we should consider is repairing the wind farms that we already have. A lot of the heavy lifting around them has been done. The grid connections have been put in, the substations have been put in, the access has been put into them. As a wind farm reaches the end of its operational life, which is around 20 to 25 years, then you take the turbines down and repairing involves putting new, modern, more efficient ones up. Now, the modern, more efficient turbines are generally taller than the ones that exist, so you will see them more, but you can put in fewer turbines and get out either the same amount of electricity or more from the same site. And picking up on the embodied carbon and uh, recycling, what we're also seeing in Scotland is um, real pioneering work being done around how we now recycle the parts from our wind turbines. So again, the embodied energy that's being used in our low carbon generating technologies is itself being decarbonised. Okay, Colin Campbell. <clears throat> I think for, for agriculture and land use, there is a, a lot of new technologies which really uh, um, rely on having the Internet of Things available in all parts of the country at the right kind of speeds. Um, so there's a lot of robotics, um, artificial intelligence methods that are coming along, which will mean our systems are more efficient and produce less greenhouse gas emissions. But that will depend on that sort of wireless infrastructure being ready to use in many remote parts of the country. I think the other thing about the land use is the kind of the green infrastructure. I suspect that's not what you're referring to, but um, but I think you know we we can think about our planning yeah, framework. About so our, our natural it's assets. You know, yeah. it's about getting the green infrastructure right as well, uh, and the natural assets that are in that green infrastructure. I mean, one of the new ways we're thinking about agriculture is how do we redesign diversity back into the system, and that means having multiple varieties of crops or different crops or intercropping. Uh, making sure that you've got weeds at the margins of the, of the field that can attract the right pollinators and predators that prevents you from having to apply so much chemical herbicides, etc. So there's lots of ways we can think about infrastructure and uh, kind of redesigning and uh, putting diversity back into our green infrastructure, I think, is a big one. Mm -hmm. Jess Pepper. Um, yeah, I've talked about the good stuff. Um, I've got a recent SPICE um, publication highlighted that in terms of our pipeline spend, having um, reduced the amount that was being spent on high carbon infrastructure, actually the pipeline spend demonstrates that we're actually heading towards locking in more high carbon infrastructure into the future, which is a worrying trend and clearly we're in a em climate emergency, we need to be reviewing that. Um, I borrowed from a climate striker, I know a model of what the problem is on transport. Each one of these Duplo blocks, if you're familiar, is uh, one million represents one million tons of carbon uh, CO2 equivalent. And the yellow blocks, the very bottom one is all the public transport and bikes and trains and all. This top one is air, so welcome the decision on air passenger duty. The yellow is road traffic. And one of the alarming things in drafting this was for me, and it was being brought to my attention by these strikers, that we are um, currently pulling down woodland and moving around high carbon soils and agricultural soils in order to build new roads. And that's where the bulk of our investment has been going and that's where the bulk of our planning has been going. Um, the roads which are being built sometimes are not even subject to an assessment on climate change and the impacts that when you do your strategic environmental assessment generally you scope in terms of climate. Uh, or you rule in what's important to scope on and what's not important to scope on. The A9 dueling programme, for example, didn't scope on climate, and that's going to um, target a lot of woodland, thousands of hectares, and a lot of um, high carbon soils, peatlands, which are being moved around. So in terms of what we need to reassess and reconsider in a climate emergency, 
a road building programme would be one of them. There's a great case for investing in repair, and there's a, an important case in investing in what needs to be done for safety, but in terms of what we need to be thinking about is the whole system and how we make it accessible to everyone. Um, electric vehicles, as I've said, will be part of the solution, and we should definitely take the steer from the advice that we lock into statute, that ambition on transitioning to electric vehicles. But we do need to think carefully about what the whole system does for everyone, because not everybody will have access to an electric vehicle or be able to invest in an electric vehicle. Webster. Yeah, uh, I, I think on in infrastructure, there are... in. There are the, the, the issues that come up are kind of chicken and egg issues to some extent. So, and that goes across a lot of different alternative technologies, actually. So with, with electric vehicles, you have the infrastructure of charging, with use of hydrogen, hydrogen you know, infrastructure to, to, to use for transport potentially, um, also uh, converting the gas networks to use hydrogen or allowing different um, specifications of gas to be used in the network. Um, and finally on CCS. So, um, with, with um, you're probably aware that there's a CCUS advisory group sitting, um, uh, which will produce its report in uh, uh, July. And, and interestingly, there, you know, they envisage a kind of disaggregated model. So, with with carbon capture being one part of the value chain, transport and storage being a different part. And again, you've got a chicken and egg issue there because if you lose your, you know, the, you won't build your storage unless you think people are going to capture, and you won't build your capture unless uh, the storage is available. So there are these, these kind of infrastructure issues when, when doing a modal shift or a structural shift, that those are the sort of questions that um, go to this point of, you know, where's, where are the dividing roles between the, the market and, the, and government with all of this? Uh, and so uh, I, th I think that's an important insight, actually, from, again, from the CCC report and all of, all of the work that goes with uh, energy transition in that, the, the, the infrastructure side of things is, is the one, and even down to kind of market design as well, how the, how the electricity market functions. That was all rehauled, overhauled as part of developing uh, uh, renewables. You know, other, other segments of the, of, the, of the market you know, might, may need to have that kind of, um, uh, those kind of changes as part of the policies that go with the setting of targets. Hydrogen has been mentioned a lot of times in, in passing. Um, and I guess that oil and gas industries maybe got a role to play if hydrogen is, say, the replacement fuel for, say, the gas grid, or it's the replacement fuel for the HTVs in, in, the, in the future. I, I wanted to ask a, a question. One of the submissions that came in, I think it was from Angus McCrone, he said, um, hydrogen is potentially part of the answer in residential industrial heat and indeed in long haul heavy trucks. But this is a bit highlighted. But it would have to be produced using electrolysis, not fossil fuel cracking. Could you, could you explain why you say that? We come back to this CCS um, thing that I'm supposed to have. have it is in that for, the reason why? Because you don't think that CCS. <laughs> well, if, if, if yeah. you're going to yeah. produce hydrogen by fossil means, then you, you have the CO2 to deal with. Mm -hmm. So either you just let it go or you have to. Um, store it. Um, but um, we, I'm slightly circumscribed in what I can say because we are literally about to publish a whole stream of stuff um, on hydrogen and, and the sort of future economics of things like electrolysis and so on. So I can't sort of um, uh, leak that. If that or <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, I, th I think electrolysis is interesting because, I mean, the two main ingredients of electrolysis are water and electricity, and, and Scotland potentially um, is you know, Saudi Arabia of water and, um, uh, you know, potentially uh, plentiful supplies of renewable electricity, which um, could be um, made uh, reliable around the clock with, with batteries or um, by using the hydrogen infrastructure itself. So it, it's a potentially interesting area for Scotland. I mean, I, I'd sort of counsel a bit of caution that we don't, we don't yet know exactly what's going to happen with um, electrolysis over the next 10 years and what people like us say about future costs will have some impact. But I think it's an interesting area to watch. So there's a case of two te different technologies, whichever gets there first could be the answer to hydrogen. <coughs> yeah. Uh, without getting into the battle of the technologies, but you, you can do steam methane, methane reformation today and you and turn it into hydrogen. Yeah. You also, obviously, you then have to you know, have a process for capturing uh, the carbon and storing it, which is, is not an insignificant challenge. But uh, I think the, 
it, it, those will go at different paths. But again, I would go back to my point is, you know, you, we don't have to choose today. We actually have to try all of these things and get them uh, off the ground at scale. And then it will work itself out over time. Um, and you know, that then, but the situation we are today is that if you want to develop that, develop the hydrogen economy quickly, it actually has to be off the back of um, methane and methane reformation because we don't have the, we will in the future have reliable surpluses of renewable electricity with which to do electrolysis and that will definitely be needed. But there's a sort of sequencing uh, that you know, we would envisage happening which probably has the methane reformation going first and then you have to take it from there. But they're, they're both challenging areas, I would say, so I wouldn't like to say which one is you know, um, better or worse than the others. But you know, we're in a with the, with the, 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 imp the imperative of getting to net zero means these all have to be tried and tried seriously, I would say. Yeah, Angus MacDonald. Sorry. Andy MacDonald. Angus is over there. Angus usually sits there, so that's even more confusing. Um, so yeah, I just, it's, I'll pick up on that point first. I mean, we, we are obviously in the midst of that debate about electrolysis and steam methane recovery, and which is longer term going to be the solution that we, we get to for scale. Um, we do some economic, did some economic analysis within my team. We do a, we've got a foresighting group, um, and part of the reason that we are currently looking at extending the work that we're doing within hydrogen just now into heavy transport is because at the moment we feel that in Scotland's case is about where we can do now uh, in terms of scale. If we get to a point where we're injecting hydrogen into the gas grid, then the dynamics change, the, the, the economics change. But for the moment, the opportunity in Scotland is around that, you know, those heavy transport opportunities, um, because that's what we've got now. And picking up Will's point, we need to be testing and proving that now because it's going to be part of the solution, wherever the fuel eventually comes from. Um, <clears throat> so we need to be doing that now. I, to, to the broader earlier question about the, uh, the, the, the impact and how we avoid having some of the captures on your, your question, Mark. Mm -hmm. the, uh, what some of the work that we're doing with a lot of partners in, in government and utilities, community groups and others just now around local energy systems is partly looking to try and understand what the right solutions are for different places. We did some work on typologies which looked at what an island community would do or need what would be important for a rural community that's off-grid what an urban community or an industrial estate or an industrial complex might do. The, the needs of those different areas are different. And if we're looking just now at changing the way our energy system works, it's an opportunity just now to try and capture those and find the best solutions for different communities and the best and most advantageous way of bringing a group of technologies together around that. So it may not be about just the grid bringing electricity in anymore. It clearly isn't. So if you look at some of the stuff in Orkney just now where they're piloting some of these projects using renewable electricity that's generated through EMEX testing of, med of marine devices, using some of that through electrolysis to produce hydrogen, which is being used in council vehicles, looking at grid management across the islands, looking at how the networks work across a group of islands. All of those things are piloting for the future. And we're trying to take some of that understanding and share it in other countries, in Denmark and Canada and other places where they have similar communities just now, to understand, you know, can we test those things further? Can we test those ideas out? Because that's part of the global solution, but it's also part of a very local solution yeah. for those communities. Okay, in the final 10 minutes, we've got two members with questions. Can I ask Claudia and John to both ask your questions together, and then we'll put it out to everyone, and you can signal to me whether you want to answer. Claudia. Thank you. Um, our convener's already highlighted the issues um, around the opportunities. Um, uh, in relation to net zero by 2045. Um, and could I ask very specifically if any of the panel members um, want to make any comment on um, investment, uh, both in research uh, but also, or, and also um, in, in commercial companies and the public um, sector as well. Um, this might relate to um, pension funds and divestment and reinvestment um, in relation to... Um, the relationship that companies have with shareholders and how companies can actually affect um, change as well as the shareholders themselves. And also, um, finally, um, what Mark um, Carney highlighted what seems a very long time ago now about mm -hmm. stranded assets. So I just wonder, this has obviously got to be a brief response, but um, just any comments on finance, please. And John? Um, mine was a sort of big infrastructure product that ties into uh, what Claudia said, but... Uh, um, Mr. McCrone talked about um, Saudi Arabia of water 
and self-evidently with water tables falling in England and um, groundwater levels falling as well and reservoir levels falling, should we, is now the time for someone, I'm not sure who would afford it, but to be looking at a pipeline um, to export water from Scotland. Um, oh, and I have to declare an interest in that regard as well. Um, I have a, a small company in that regard, which is absolutely dormant, I have to say. But, it, but is, that, is that something that, in a strategic sense for the whole of the United Kingdom, it's as, as an opportunity, and when it becomes a critical need, it won't, it'll be too late then to say, oh, I wish we'd done that 10 years ago, whereas the length of time it takes for these kind of projects, should we be thinking about that now? Would any of our guests like to take any of those questions and give their thoughts in the last few minutes? Nobody. Nobody? Yes, I'll go to my leg, Watson, first. Um, and then no. I'm afraid I, I can't speak to the export of water. The water and the electricity generally don't mix so well, so it's not uh, exporting water is not something my members do. Um, but picking up on the investment opportunities, uh, Scotland is regularly um, seen as one of the top countries in the world for renewable investments. When you know, we look at what's happening in offshore wind, we are seeing billions um, invested in the North Sea. So yes, there are amazing opportunities for investment. And this again is one of the reasons why we are so welcoming of the net zero target and what we expect and hope will follow, which is a very supportive policy environment. Because as I've already said around innovation, the same is true for investment. Where there's stability, where there's an ambitious target, investment will generally follow because people know that when they make an investment, there's a long-term future for it. So we are extremely optimistic about the investment. Will that help with, with large contracts? There's a concern, obviously, this week about um, BIFAP, for instance. I don't want to go into any details. We haven't got long, but I mean... Yeah. Uh, in terms of um, uh, the big contracts um, for Scottish workers, can you comment on that at all? Well, yes, as I alluded to earlier, our, uh, we had the Offshore Wind Summit on the 2nd of May when a great number of our offshore wind members did actually meet with Mr Mackay and subsequently a letter was sent on the 16th of May to the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee setting out what we're looking to do on that. As I've already said, our members really want to work with Scottish companies, but they're stuck between a rock and a hard place at the moment. Offshore developments are funded through the Contracts for Difference process out of Westminster, which pushes for the lowest possible price, which is, again, forces people to look globally for where they can find suppliers who can do that. What we want to see, as I've already said, is we want to see the Scottish infrastructure um, side of things being able to compete on a global market, not just for the projects that we do in Scotland, but for projects all the way around the world. And as I set out in uh, Mr Mackay's letter to the committee, we have come up with a, a list of actions to be done that we hope would make that a reality. Well, works, sir. Thanks. Um, so I'm going to address the, the point about investment, divestment, etc. You know, I, I, we would not see things in such black and white terms in terms of um, energy production, um, uh, investment, divestment. Um, I think we have to recognise that there are other energy policy goals around. Um, access to energy, that's one of the UN sustainable development goals. So uh, I, I would, uh, you know, we would argue that that has a value in its own right. Um, and we're not talking about black and white here when we're talking about where companies put their money. Um, I think the other thing we would we would say is that, you know, all co companies are different. They all have their own strategies. Um, so being involved in a company as a shareholder, you know, gives you the right to go along and ask about, you know, stranded assets and that, that kind of question. And that that's a value in retaining uh, a stake in a company and that gives you a voice. So uh, we would not, re we do not think actually divesting from particular sectors all particular companies is a good idea, unless, you know, for a commercial reason, um, and your questions are not answered about their strategy, then that's fine. No, no, no. Divesting from companies. I'm I did use the, the word reinvestment as well. I'm yeah, not being defensive about that. No, I, no, I, yeah. no, I understand. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think, you know, the, 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 um, the, uh, the value that, the, as a shareholder, as an institutional shareholder, that gives you the right to question the strategy of that company. That's really valuable. So I think you know, I would counsel, if I was involved in such an exercise, I would counsel against 
you know, taking yourself out of the tent, actually, you know, you've got a voice as a shareholder, and particularly as an institutional shareholder, about those kind of commercial questions. Um, and I th think finally on the um, investment side, yes, you know, I, I, the, the, um, as, as I alluded to earlier, these, the, the, these big changes that have happened and need, will need to happen, you know, there's a setting of the institutional framework around those that takes you from the, you know, uh, takes you from the example project to the first of the kind project at scale, to to the state of affairs where these are, you know, part of the um, part of the part of normality, if you see what I mean. And the, that's where the government and policy role comes in, and that's the role that, you know, governments played in the uh, renewable electricity sector. And this kind of role is something. You know, this, this, these are the sort of questions that then need to be asked when we get to the implementation of the policies that are there to deliver the targets. And that's, you know, the important next step in all of this. Okay. Diana Casey. I think um, my biggest concern regarding investment, um, particularly in EIIs, is trying to remain competitive in the UK. Um, I think the, uh, there's been a big opportunity missed when looking just at territorial emissions, um, if we move to a consumption-based emissions system, you give your industry a little bit more um, certainty that you're keen to attract their investment while they decarbonise and not just... Um, well, I would say all our carbon budgets at the moment could actually be met through deindustrialisation, um, which isn't good for the economy at all. So I think... Um, if we move to consumption-based emission reporting, we might well attract more investment in the UK. And it would be interesting to see whether we could actually repatriate some of the industries we might have lost and bring some more of those consumption emissions back under our control, um, which I think would be better for the environment, it would be great for the economy, and it would send great signals to industry that we're wanted in the UK and in Scotland. Okay. Angus Macron. That's a good point, by the way. But um, the... Um, the way of sort of bringing the, the pressure that investors are uh, putting to bear on, on companies um, together with the sort of opportunities for Scotland is, I think, that um, companies are, are really treating sustainability far more seriously than they ever have been up to now, and, and we're seeing that with um, the work that we're doing um, and, the, and the sort of response to that. And it's sort of going down the supply chain as well. So it's not just sort of head office of Walmart or whatever. It's um, you know, everybody they deal with and, and so on. And that's happening on a global basis. Um, and what Scotland can offer is um, very cheap renewable energy. So if these companies are wanting to source 100% um, uh, of their electricity from renewables by a particular date, 2023 20, or whatever, then um, the sort of cleanest way to do it and be sure that you're actually um, uh, enabling new projects to be built is by signing power purchase agreements with new renewable energy projects and this could be onshore or offshore wind in Scotland. So I think there's a sort of opportunity there for Scotland to, to sort of uh, take advantage of, of its natural resources and, and become part of that. And to McDonald's. <clears throat> Sorry, just a couple of relatively small pieces of both jigsaws, I guess. We haven't been asked to help construct the pipeline yet, but um, the response for a responsibility for our part of the Hydro Nation uh, project uh, at a Scottish level within Scottish Enterprise sits within my team as well. And we are seeing a lot of interest around technologies to do with improving water quality and, and developments uh, which are exportable, tradable, and, and are being taken to some parts of the world where they have a significant impact. And the other was just from a public sector perspective around some of the investment, um, some of the projects that we've worked on through and with communities and with some of the early stage innovative technologies have obviously been supported through the Renewable Energy Investment Fund and the now Energy Investment Fund um, through the Scottish Investment Bank and my colleagues there we're working with just now in terms of trying to make some, some cases toward the, the work of the new Scottish National Investment Bank, which clearly may be at a significantly greater scale but within its low carbon mission, which we hope it's, it's going to be focused on, um, we're looking at where they, they may be able to extend that reach uh, into other areas with, with more capital. Okay, we're rapidly running out of time. I want to take Andrew Midgley very quickly and then Jess Pepper. I'm afraid we're going to have to round things up. So, Andrew Midgley. Thank you. Um, it's just on the issue of investment, and I hope I'm not too far off from what, uh, the sort of the topic that you're intending. I just wanted to make the point that there's. 
various forms of investment needed specifically with regard to farming. The first one, with private investors, and I'm talking about SMEs, and clearly it's a different conversation, but with, with SMEs, they need clarity if they're going to invest in their businesses in the context of the policy context that they find themselves at the moment. They need clarity and on the direction of travel. Now, there are opportunities, and, they, and people will be seeking to identify and um, sort of invest in those opportunities, but they need, need sort of clear... Uh, direction of travel so that they know where their businesses are expected to go. The, 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 that applies too in the food chain with uh, people needing to invest in, in supporting the industry. They need confidence that there's going to be ongoing market. And then finally, public investment is critical, especially, and it relates back to the issue on public goods, the role of the state against private investment. The role of the state in the delivery of public goods is really critically important and in investing in advice, in uh, sort of infrastructure within the industry. It doesn't necessarily mean, I'm not necessarily talking about just handing out money. It's about inv helping people invest uh, through soft loans, things like that. There's a whole range of things that can be done. And Jess Pepper, finally. I'll be as quick as I can. Um, really just to go back to where we started with, we, need, we know where we're wanting to go now, and that's great, but we need certainty in terms of how we're going to get there so that folk can invest in it and have confidence in it and can map out what, how they're going to um, contribute to that. And that may mean that we may need something more than just policy, because policy hasn't always worked in the past. There may be things which could go into a statutory framework which is more about the how. So the climate change plan was quite sectoral before. Actually, if we could achieve something that gives the sectors the certainty they need but also achieve some level of integration, then that would be, because that's where you get the synergies and, you know, soils are important, but they're important across the board and all sorts of, um, from different angles. Um, and it may be that we need somebody to champion that. Uh, we, maybe we need a climate commissioner or a commission to oversee and make those connections and encourage the sectors where there's a bit of sluggishness or there's a new creative connection to be made. I'm going to be kind to Colin Campbell because you're from my neck of the woods. You wanted to come in briefly. Yeah, so I'll try and be as brief as I can, but on the pipeline I can't answer the question fully, but I can tell you there's about 160 billion cubic metres of rainfalls in Scotland, but it varies and it can be 100 billion sometimes, so there's a lot of variation, so we need to be very careful about what we do with our water, uh, despite the fact that yesterday's rain is tomorrow's whiskey. Um, and on funding in particular, obviously, um, the research is a vital part of our infrastructure and the science is a vital part of our infrastructure and we have had a lot of cuts in our research over the last 10 years and it's austerity and not being in a protected budget but I'd like to think a climate crisis would mean more money for research going forward. Okay, thank you very much for everyone for their time today. That includes, concludes the committee's business in public today. At its next meeting on the 4th of June, the committee will be taking further evidence in relation to the Scottish Government budget and the committee will reconvene in private session at 2.30 this afternoon to consider the evidence we heard in the bill this morning. The meeting is now suspended and I ask that the public gallery be cleared. Thank you very much to everyone.